Hello and welcome to this brand new episode of the Silmarillion Film Project. I am your co-host Dave Kale, broadcasting to you live from sunny but slightly chilly Pasadena, California. And today we have a very exciting episode for you. We're going to be talking about dwarves. Dwarf episodes, of course, are uh, notorious in um, Tolkien professor podcasting, um, uh, like, lore, I think. Like, I think some of our best uh, Riddles in the Dark episodes are definitely, like, you know, the, like, episodes oh, yeah. where we went on and on about how, how we <laughs> hoped that the, the Hobbit adaptation would just be, like, a recapitulation of the Battle of Azanolbazar and all that Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Back uh, in the days so. when I taught my, uh, my, my autocorrect to leap to to uh, you know to any time i hit az uh you know that it wouldn't it, you know it, it would immediately fill in as an old bazaar yeah that's that's yeah. fantastic i remember those yes. days so so we're excited to excited to dive into some of the dwarf stuff for silmarillion because i i think this is one of the topics this is one of one of the many topics when you're talking about a possible adaptation of silmarillion where um there's a lot of a lot of space for oh yeah for, Filling, filling in gaps and, and adding and adding things that will make purists scream. So, um, uh, which is which is a big part of what this endeavor is about. I think. Absolutely. So, and, part of our, uh, part of our and mission the, statement. <laughs> part of our mission statement, yeah. And you know, if we have time, we might get to Al too. He's kind of important. So, yeah. anyway, without further ado, let me introduce my co-hosts. I have with me. The uh, Tolkien Maven Trish Lambert coming to us from. Where are you? Where have you? What? Have, what's the new name of your place now, Trish? Waymead. Waymead. I now right. officially named my property permanently Waymead. Nice. So, until you until you permanently name it a get different again. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Not now. We'll see. All right. It could happen. Okay. Okay. We're, we're sticking with this one then. And yeah. of course, we're joined as always by the Tolkien professor Corey Olson. Excellent. Yeah. Happy New Year. No, thank you. Yes. Happy New Year, everybody. It's our. It's been almost an entire month since we've had a a, a film film broadcast, having skipped a session for the you know that fell right in the middle of the holiday season there at the end of December. So we're now back into the swing here, uh, and uh, glad to be back. So thanks everybody for uh, joining us here today. Um, yeah, Dave. This is really fun. The, the the dwarf stuff. I would say in the Silmarillion, as you say, there's a great deal of scope there, and it's not just that there's a great deal of scope. There are a bunch of things in the Silmarillion, of course, that Tolkien doesn't go into very much detail about, and so it leaves a great deal of scope. Like for instance, you know, as we've talked about, why did the you know what was going on with the men? Right, the men come and settle in Beleriand, and apart from the fact that we're told that some people settled down in some various different places, we don't really know anything about their lives or what they were doing or what they were up to exactly uh, during you know until the time comes when like their famous descendants arise to do heroic things like Hurin and Turin and folks like that. Um, so. There are some places like that where we just have, you know, the, the 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 sort of historical survey of the Silmarillion is just kind of quiet on some points that gives us a lot of scope to uh, to sort of sort of settle down and, and and think about some new stories. But this is a, even actually so this is true. Like that's that stuff is all true of the dwarves as well. But there's even more going on here, right? Uh, here we get an opportunity to do a really fun and amusingly controversial thing as well, uh, which is do some of the, make some of the changes and alterations that Tolkien himself would have done but didn't get a chance to do. It's very clear, for instance, that, uh, that you know, the, the dwarves, the role of the dwarves, the identity of the dwarves was obviously very much in flux throughout the Silmarillion period. I mean, there's, there are very few elements of the story uh, as far as character groupings and things like that that change more than the dwarves do from the beginning. You know, like the Noldor are pretty much the Noldor from the beginning. You know, the Sindar, their names change around a bit. But again, like, the identity of the elves is comparatively stable. Um, at least, you know, many of the, the core concepts there really don't change. The humans are basically the humans, and they don't change much either. The dwarves undergo radical changes from the time when uh, Tolkien first introduced them in the uh, very early Silmarillion material, where they were basically just creatures of Morgoth and uh, uh, not even craftsmen. They were merchants rather than craftsmen. The 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 first time the dwarves are discussed uh, in Tolkien's earliest Silmarillion, back in the uh, in the the 1930 Quentin Older Inwa, it was they they were like specifically 
it, it was their lack of craftsmanship that was specifically noted about them, that they didn't care about things, making things, they just cared about selling them and making a profit. Um, so a- anyway, they go from, you know, these really unscrupulous profit, you know, warmongering, profiteering uh, 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 peoples to, you know, the very much more comparatively heroic, though not still you know, perfectly wonderful at all points, uh, people that we get in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Anyway, the, uh, the, the point is, there's a, there are some very, very serious shifts that happen, and Tolkien, this is one of those things where Tolkien's ideas had clearly changed through the period of time when he was writing first The Hobbit, but then even more The Lord of the Rings, and of course, after the Lord of the Rings, he never really fully goes back and completes the process of reintegrating the new ideas from the bottom up throughout the Silmarillion material. And this is very visible in the published Silmarillion, um, that the dwarves are very much kind of marginalized, you know, uh, bec- and I think in large part because when Christopher Tolkien was editing the summer, he didn't have that much to work with because most of the stuff that had actually been written about the dwarves was no longer relevant, right? Because Tolkien's ideas of them had shifted. Um, so I, you know, in a lot of ways, my sort of, and this is a very kind of very broad overview sort of statement and they're obvious some obvious exceptions to this kind of thing, but uh, but any, I, I think this is really a, 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 a job of creation and world building that Tolkien never finished. Going back and saying what, you know, with the new dwarves, with the, the dwarves as he was conceiving them towards the end of his writing career, after the Lord of the Rings, what was their first age stories? What were they really like all the way through? We don't really get that. So we get the job of kind of doing that, right? You know, he did do it some, and I agree, but again, he never really finished it. And you can see that Christopher was loath to include very much of it, right? Which is why we get so little of the dwarves. Uh, only, you know, almost everything that we have to work with that we're going to be talking about today are picked in, f- picked up for just like odd sentences and references here and there. Um, and we get to think of the story behind them. So, um Anyway, that's uh, so. So that's why this 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 topic of the dwarves, and especially here in season four, this is the this is the the meat of it, right? We we did a lot with the dwarves last season in season three, uh, which was really cool, and I, I really like what we did with the the dwarves and the green elves and the Sindar and the way that we began to establish that there uh, in earl, in early Beleriand. Now we get to really set the stage and do some of the complicated things that we didn't have time. The, we didn't want to rush through, and we kind of uh, kicked them down the road into season four, uh, and now we get to really deal with them, so I'm pretty excited about that. All right. Um, so, but first, actually, before we get too far into that, I want to uh, make sure we do our announcements, because we have several announcements of things that are coming up very soon. Uh, first, the spring semester begins on Monday. So on Monday, our spring semester starts at Signum University. Uh, if you've been thinking about auditing one of our courses, or uh, uh, or even if you're uh, one of our enrolled students and you haven't signed up yet, no time like the present because classes start in three days. So, uh, and of course, it is still possible to uh, uh, to enroll in one of our classes after they begin. We allow enrollment through the first two weeks, but obviously. Uh, the longer you wait, the You're further. not supposed to say that now. You're supposed to say that at, like, next, you know, well, no, like, I mean, after. You, I'm just, I, I don't, no, because <laughs> I don't, oh, don't, don't want to. for a week. <laughs> I don't want to be like, I don't want to be like, you've got to do it now. And then next week be like, well, actually, it's fine. You can still enroll. Like, I, you know, then no one will take well, me seriously. Well, you sound like, you know, due to popular demand, you know, but I know. <laughs> no, right, no, no, no. Standard it, policy. Right. Every semester, you know, our ad That's period true. goes for a couple weeks. Yes. But obviously, you're going to be buying the eight ball if you don't sign up That's right. right at the beginning of semester. So yeah. if you want to be there at the beginning, now's the time. Um, and TextMoot. So TextMoot is next Saturday. It is a week from tomorrow, January 19th. Uh, registration is now closed. The online registration is closed. But uh, word on the street is that a few extra spots were retained in anticipation of latecomers. So if you would still like to come to TextMoot, TextMoot is being held in Waco, Texas. Um, and if you would still like to come, 
there are still uh, the, it, it is still possible. So go to textmoot.org uh, and there, you'll see those. There's uh, an email address that you can contact. Just let us know. Uh, even you can even send a, an email to info at signumuniversity.org and we'll we'll connect you there too. So um, anyway, uh, there's uh, so so textmoot is going to be. And I say that registration is closed. We have like a hundred and five people coming to textmoot. It is. Uh, enormous text mood is uh, uh, what like 20% larger than last year which was already yeah. you know, having broken its own record uh, as our biggest regional moot so uh, text mood is a an enormous event uh, so, so everything's bigger in Texas including the regional moots uh, so uh, I, uh, I hope you'll be able to join us for that um, Mythmoot six, Mythmoot six is going to our registration is going to be opening soon. We're opening registration a little bit later this year than we did last year, but it is still coming. Uh, it's going to be at the end of June, uh, 2019. Uh, that's going to it's going to be very exciting. We have uh, already some uh, pretty exciting news for that when we uh, when we uh, when we launch it. So um, keep your eye out for registration. There, we'll be posting that. I hope within the next week. Um, some final details are needing to work out with the venue before we uh, officially can open there, but we're in the process there. And after text moot, our next regional moot is sunshine moot down in Florida. So in Orlando, we're going to be or around Orlando, not exactly in Orlando. Uh, we're going to be meeting on March 23rd and the registration for that will be opening very soon as well. So uh, uh, if you are in uh, or you want to come down to Orlando, uh, then uh, uh, you'd be very welcome to come join us. That would be a fun destination moot to do. Um, so that's going to be, again, on Saturday, March 23rd. And those are our announcements. All right. So, our goals. Our goals for this session are... Uh, well, okay. And I say for this session, <laughs> for this topic of discussion, we'll see how much we get through in this session. Um, we need to talk about the dwarves and the petty dwarves, uh, especially the petty dwarves in particular are a concept that we sort of punted down the road um, uh, uh, pretty much completely. We talked about it last year, but we didn't end up incorporating the petty dwarves and their story into the actual uh, episodes uh, of, uh, of season three. So we definitely need it's and it's now it's definitely time to do that. We decided that wasn't mere procrastination. We decided we wanted to wait for the story of the petty dwarves until we got to the point where the petty dwarves were being evicted by the incoming elves, which is what is going to lead eventually to memes resentment. And by the way, that's a perfect illustration of what I'm talking about, right? Um, the this entire plot thread, like this entire. A um, uh, uh, storyline is inspired by like one sentence that meme says to Turin at one point, right? Like something that meme drops in conversation during the Turin story uh, when he talks about how the petty dwarves once lived uh, in, uh, you know, what became Nargothrond until the elves came, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, it's um. This is exactly the kind of thing that we get when we're adapting the Silmar the dwarf stuff in the Silmarillion. We get, you know, whole stories that lie behind single sentences and references, uh, undeveloped references that characters make, and Tolkien doesn't tell us anything about that story, really. Um, but we get to uh, we get to 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 make it up. So, uh, and that's what's so much fun, right? Exactly. Oak. We, we get to be Aule. Uh, how much fun is that? And then, of course, hopefully, if we get there, we'll get to Aeol. I have very small aspirations of getting past Aeol, uh, covering all of those things and uh, and talking about other things, uh, but we'll see. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, good. And Marie, I agree. It is the Hobbit. The Hobbit is really the turning point in Tolkien's career um, for the dwarves which is actually enormously striking i mean when you something that will totally blow your mind like if you want to have your mind totally blown about the hobbit um there are two 
foolproof methods for this, right? One, of course, the first is to go back and reread the first edition of chapter five if you never have. That is the first thing, of course, that you should do if you want to blow your mind about The Hobbit. But the second thing you should do if you want to blow your mind about The Hobbit is go back and read what Tolkien said about dwarves at the time he wrote The Hobbit. Um, which is the early 30s, right? Between 1930 and 1933, during that time, especially right around 1930, was the time when he wrote the early, like the, you know, the Unexpected Party and stuff like that. Um, there was a gap before he finished the end. Uh, so that's when we're talking about, like up in 1933, potentially. But, um, but yeah, so like 1930, 1931 is when he's writing at least from Bag End through the arrival in Lake Town um, is all happening during that early period. So go uh, to, uh, and you can find it in the shaping of middle earth. Um, the early stuff, the sketch of the mythology and then the Quenta and older which follows it um, and read what the dwarves are like and what he says about the dwarves. And then imagine Tolkien sitting down and writing the Hobbit, at that time and uh, you know with those uh, with those dwarves it's amazing it's completely mind blowing um yeah yeah um yeah good um and uh, and of course i agree as i've said many many times over many years uh the hobbit was not was you know there's a firewall up between the hobbit and uh, you know, that's the, the metaphor I often use. You know, there's still a firewall between The Hobbit and his Silmarillion material. He did not contend the, intend them to be continuous stories. But it's still mind-blowing. Well, <laughs> we're going to have to make them continuous stories. So exactly. That's gonna be, we yeah. are. We are. Exactly. And I think that we can see, and I still, I agree with Marie, that what happens with the dwarves, in particular, Thorin Oakenshield's transformation, the sort of the redemption of Thorin Oakenshield at the end of... Um, of The Hobbit is really, I think, the thing, you know, it, Thorin's deathbed is, in my opinion, what changes dwarves for Tolkien. Like, that was the moment when he uh, decided dwarves were going in a different direction. Almost everything that the dwarves do in The Hobbit leading up to that point, up to the, the, the heroic self-sacrifice and then um, uh, deathbed repentance of Thorin. Uh, is consistent with the much less attractive earlier ideas. And I'm, I'm not saying the ideas are unattractive. I'm saying that the ideas about are that the dwarves should be unattractive. Um, uh, it, it's, 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 it's all pretty consistent with that. Um, when Thorin Oakenshield makes his change, the dwarves are changed, I think, in Tolkien's mind. Um, they end up in a different place at the end of The Hobbit. And I think we see that. We see that right away when he starts writing The Lord of the Rings. Um, and we don't get a lot of dwarves right away, of course. Gimli is our primary dwarf, but, um, but dwarves, are, dwarves are different. And you can't, you can't go on with the Silmarillion in the same way. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Ellen... Uh, uh, Ellen asked, do I think his intention when writing uh, was for the Elven King not to come across as unreasonably racist and cruel, that his cruelty towards dwarves was originally uh, imagined to be justified? Yeah, at least partially. I mean, he's uh, that line that the Elven King delivers to Bilbo in chapter 16, right? When he says, I have perhaps more knowledge of dwarves in particular than you do, right? When he's telling Bilbo that going back to Thorin and telling him that you stole the Arkenstone and gave it away, really probably not a good idea, Bilbo, right? Um, like a noble sentiment and everything, but I know dwarves better than you do. And I'm telling you, that is a really bad idea, right? Um, yeah, I, I think... I think that we are supposed to think that the Elven King knows what he's talking about there. And he is at least partially justified by events. Um, I do think if Gandalf hadn't shown up, Thorin probably, I think there's every reason to think Thorin would have actually thrown Bilbo off the wall to his death uh, had Gandalf not, uh, not revealed himself at that point. Um, so, uh, anyway. Uh, so, I... Um, so yes, I do think that the dwar the the Elven King now Ellen I still would say the Elven King is still culpable 
I think that uh, it seems to me fairly clear that The Hobbit is not just expecting us to take the Elven King's side completely and believe that he is absolutely right and the dwarves are completely wrong. Um, the Elven King is wrong to act the way that he does. And he, all of them, I mean, uh, it's one of the things that I think is so interesting about um, the end, you know, the tensions at the Lonely Mountain is that everybody is wrong, except Bilbo, right? Bilbo is the one who's sort of standing outside of all of these racial and political conflicts that are going on there at the mountain. And, he, and, and Bilbo's being fed up with the whole thing and just trying to help everybody to get along, I think is very clearly where we as readers are supposed to be as well. So it's not that the elves are right and the dwarves are wrong, but it is certainly that the Elven King is at least, at least partially justified in his view of dwarves. Um, yeah, anyway, so lots of, uh, uh, lots of complicated things going on here. Um, but let's, uh, let's talk about the dwarves and the petty dwarves here specifically. So, okay, here's, here's the sort of array of questions that we have sort of major issues that we need to deal with when we're thinking about the dwarves in season four. Um, first, we have the foundation of their relationship with the Sindar uh, from last season, but of course we need to introduce them to the Noldor. So how are we going to handle the, the, the encounters between the Noldor and the dwarves, and how do we develop the relationship between the, the Noldor and the dwarves? Um, you know, they've, we, we've already broken the ice to some extent with the Sindar, but we need to think about the Noldor angle specifically on both sides there. Um, Secondly, we've got the specific story of Nargothrond. Based on Meme's words, we do know that we need that there needs to be dwarvish involvement. And we also know that dwarves helped Finrod in the making of Nargothrond. Um, so we have those two dwarvish connections to Nargothrond. A, that the dwarves um, labored uh, uh, and helped him. And the second, that the petty dwarves later on will consider themselves... Um, uh, kicked out. We'll consider that you know their 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 land to have been taken from them by Finrod. Uh, and how do we handle that? Especially since I think we all agree that we don't want Finrod to be a, a jerk. You know who is uh, uh, you know slaughtering or uh, 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 kicking out the indigenous peoples when he arrives at Nargothrond. I don't think that's a a picture any of us really want to have attached to Finrod Felagund, so we need to figure out if, if not, then how did that come about? Um, we've got specifically the Sons of Fanor, that's kind of a subset of the Noldor meeting question, but in particular, one of the, again, one of those sentences that we get uh, in the published Silmarillion is that they established a trade relationship with Karanthir and that he was greatly enriched thereby. So uh, how does that come about? And Karanthir of all people, right? How does that happen? Um, and then we've got to think about our established dwarf characters, of which there are really four. Um, Telkar, the smith, who is arguably the most important uh, in that he's the one who gets alluded to in The Lord of the Rings, right? Um, and is therefore in this way the most enduring of all of the elf, uh, the dwarf characters. Um, the great smith, who is of course going to forge Narsal, which is what he's mentioned for in The Lord of the Rings. Um, and we have Norn, the character that we invented, uh, but who we gave a lot of uh, activity to. Uh, in uh, Season 3, he was our primary dwarf protagonist and representative and ambassador uh, in Season 3. So what happens with him and what role does he play? Azakal and Lauren are the two dwarf kings uh, of the, uh, the, the, two, you know, the, the peoples of Belagost and Nagrod, respectively. Um, uh, and we had decided that we want Azekal to be awesome, right? We want his death, uh, to be, um, you know, when he dies in battle and is killed by the dragon, we want that to be a big deal, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, and for him to, to be, to be a hero and to die a hero's death. Um, and then finally, the general issue of mortality, uh, and this is a really fun one, I, I, and I, that you guys have been doing, as always, uh, some really wonderful thinking on the discussion boards about this kind of thing. This is a really, really important issue, and and one of those things which never gets mentioned um, in the Silmarillion, of course. We know that when Beor dies of old age, 
it is mentioned, right? Uh, it's kind of made a big deal of. This is the first time the elves have ever seen anybody die of old age, and they're really puzzled, right? That this this whole concept of mere mortality, just getting old and dying, is a new thing to them that they're trying to wrap their brains around when it happens to Beor. The logical question is, so I guess that means they don't encounter it in dwarves? Because dwarves also die of old age, so how do we handle that? Right. How do we, you know, I mean, on the one hand, since the dwarves don't live with them, it will be easy enough to just have no dwarf dying peaceably of old age um, in the presence of elves. But it kind of seems, especially where we're developing friendships between elves and dwarves, like there's got to be some kind of actual concealment. Right. So I I think it's a really interesting and important question. You would think the elves would. You would think the elves would be like, hey, uh, I haven't seen uh, Frank in a while. What happened <laughs> yeah, to him? Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, it's not – this I don't think is a huge puzzle to solve. I mean, just saying the dwarves are secretive about it I think is enough of an answer. Uh, it solves the problem. But I do think that it would be worthwhile to bring it in, you know, to uh, – uh, to, and, and to me, the logical – the most logical instance for this is Norn, right? Um Norn, he can't stick around forever, right? A good deal of time is passing here. And so Norn, if we don't kill him off in some other way, is going to, is got to die of old age, you know, sometime before the end of season four. Right. Um, so anyway, I, 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 I think that, um, he would be, and also I would say, given the fact that Norn is the one that we have had most close in friendship with the elves, um, and having the most positive relationship with the elves, he's the one where it would be most awkward, right? When he, as he's getting old, on the one hand, he he's probably going to want to say goodbye to his elvish friends and allies, and he's certainly going to want to make sure that the whole like relationship between the elves and the dwarves, which has become his life's work, really, right? He's going to want to make sure that that gets kind of handed down to somebody else. And but how do you? Elves don't appoint successors, <laughs> right? I mean, not not. Not like that, you know. They don't just like, because uh, you got to think if he if, if there's a you know there's got to be a scene right where he's like okay so here's the guy who's going to take over as ambassador for me right uh, I'm not going to do this anymore and like his friends his elf friends are going to be like uh why not <laughs> what's wrong are you did we offend you in some way are you you're leaving why are you leaving right um so uh. You know, that's um, uh, and Ellen, I agree. I was thinking about that, too. The vis- the visible aging of the dwarves has got to be something that um, is got to be strange, too. Right. Um, that they um, are, you know, that they're growing gray and their beards are getting white. And, and you know, I, I, that's surely they will have noticed this. Now, on the subject of noticing things, Halstein points out that elves probably have noticed that animals die of <laughs> old age too, right? Um, yes. Yes. I agree, Halstein. That's certainly true. So one thing I think that we have to perhaps, you know, back up and think more about is actually c- come back from the other direction and think about Beor. Um, the point of the Beor story can't be, obviously, Halstein, as you point out, it would be absurd for us to try to depict the elves as being like, what? Things die? Just Things just die like that? That's amazing. I never knew things died. Like, of course, they've seen, they see plants die every year. They see, um, you know, they've seen animals. Sur- surely they will have had, you know, pets. We know they raise horses uh, and, and, uh, and, and have hounds, right? We know that that is true at the very least, uh, even if they don't have any other pets. Surely. There have been, you know, uh, thousands of generations of animals that have grown old and died uh, since they, the elves, have been uh, uh, living with them and working with them. So, um, now, Nick, you're right that um, animals aren't children of Iluvatar, right? So that could be, that could be, it's not that mortality exists in the world isn't the insight, right? The insight is that, wait that we thought being the only children of Iluvatar that we know, we thought that, um, 
uh, children of Iluvatar don't die. That's the difference between animals and children of Iluvatar, right? Um, uh, yeah, I think these things are all pretty easily, um, not easily, but but I think there's solutions for all these. Like, I think clearly, clearly mortality, um, they they don't, and and I think with the dwarves, the dwarves aren't sort of the you know their status as children of Iluvatar is kind of ambiguous. Um, and so I think you're right. I think I think what we can part of what we need to do here is we need to interpret, reinterpret that um, that that statement about the elves and Baor, like not not simply and literally, but to think a little more, think about a more nuanced interpretation of it. That you know maybe it's the first sort of very personal, upfront, close encounter that they have with mortality amongst the children of of Iluvatar. And in the case of the dwarves, if if you know, maybe maybe they know that the dwarves grow old and they disappear, but they don't get they don't participate because the dwarves don't like invite them to visit them on their deathbed and stuff. Right. Right. What if And they don't talk don't discuss it openly. Yeah. I have an idea. One of the big questions, right? Especially with the Noldor when the Noldor come in again, one of the things that we are told is an issue when elves first encounter dwarves is they're trying to figure out what category of thing they are, right? Are these are these creatures of Melkor? Are these are they are they yeah, to use that C.S. Lewis term which I always find so useful uh, because there's no equivalent word no equivalent vocabulary in Tolkien's world are they now you know are they are they a rational species are they um you know are they like us basically are they children of Iluvatar um I think that that question could be a really live question for the elves even for the Sindar who know the dwarves like okay but are the are the dwarves really children of Iluvatar because we know the dwarves aren't going to tell them what they know about their origins um, we know they're secretive about that, right? So they're not going to say where they came from. Um, the elves will have been told that they are the first children of Iluvatar, and even the rumors that they've heard, they've heard rumors that there are going to be second comers, but the dwarves aren't it. Um, because and, and, and they can put that together. The Noldor and the Sindar together can piece that out definitively, right? Because the uh, Noldor will have heard in Valinor that the second comers are coming, but that they have not been born yet. And when they get, when they, the Noldor, get to Beleriand, they learn from the Sindar that the dwarves have been around for a long time already. So that's obviously not who the who they learned about in Valinor. Uh, the, the the second children who are who are coming. Um, so anyway, I I um I uh, I have. I have this sort of idea that maybe there should be a kind of um, there should be a kind of uh, debate, right, about what is the status of dwarves. I'm not saying we need to depict a debate on screen, but there should be there should be a debate about are you know are these dwarves children of uh, of Iluvatar at all, um, or are they creatures of Melkor? Because I mean, what else is there, right? I mean, that's kind of it among rational or apparently rational species. Um, and yeah, Ellen, I know that incarnates is Tolkien's word, but I don't like it. It's, it's not the same vocabulary because incarnates means, you know, you have, uh, you have a fea and a roa, a spirit and a body. Um, but those who are not incarnate are still now in, uh, in Lewis's terms. I, the, the Maiar and Valar are now also, but they're not incarnates. There is no category for, you know, I, I could, uh, living creature with a rational mind and free will, which is basically what now means. Um, there's no overall category that encompasses all of the different manifestations of that. Uh, so, which is why I find that from, uh, from, uh, out of the silent planet, such a useful piece of vocabulary that Tolkien doesn't really have. Uh, but anyway, um, so, um, Here's the thing, though. Okay, so we could say that Aule told the dwarves, or told the Noldor about the dwarves. And I know that Tolkien introduced that possibility. But here's the problem. If that's the case, then what's the issue? 
Noldor looking down upon and mistreating dwarves in Beleriand is utterly indefensible. If they have it on Aule's, if 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 they had a conversation with Aule, in which Aule was like, "Hey, I made these creatures. They're small and furry, but awesome. And uh, you might meet them when you go to Middle Earth. If you do, say hi." Right? Like, if they had that conversation with Aule, and then they get to Middle Earth, and they're like, "Who are these stunted people?" And we've got Noldor killing them uh, mistakenly. Why? Like, what the possible excuse is there for that? Again, this is one of those. Um, this is one of those things that um, one of those things that Tolkien didn't re- resolve is what I'm talking about when I say that Tolkien never completed the process of going back and reworking the the Silmarillion story with like his final ideas about dwarves installed from the get go. Um, and to me, I think that I I would vote against. In as much as this is an election, I would vote against having Aule have spoken of them explicitly, because then it's an obedience question, um, and it's a really, really bad look for the. It makes it makes the Noldor super culpable. I think if they have been told about the dwarves and they're essentially disregarding it, right? Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, jealousy. That, I, by the way, I, I, I think I concur. I, I think I, I think I think this needs to be handled um, with more nuance. Like, because because you're because you're right. We don't want we don't we already have plenty of stories about obedience uh, of the Noldor to to the Valar. Um, we don't need more stories about that. I think the dwarves should be left as more of a mystery. Yes. Um, yes. Um, I think it's far more interesting all around if that's mm-hmm. just a mystery, right? Um, and especially since they're not telling, right? So even if you ask them, they won't tell you. Um, so it also creates a lot of scope for very understandable, though potentially tragic, misunderstandings, right? There could be some of the elves who are thoroughly convinced based on the evidence that the dwarves really are creatures of Melkor, especially once it's clear that what Melkor and the bad guys in Beleriand are doing is not just waging open war, but being devious and subverting folks, right? We're going to talk, you know, the next big subject we're going to move on to after we talk about the dwarves and Aeol is going to be the bad guy plot. And in particular, uh, the uh, capture and release uh, elf subversion uh, and espionage plot. Um, so once any wind of that kind of gets out, we're gonna we're gonna have lots of reasons for them to for people to be thinking, okay, Melkor and his folks are pretty devious, right? What if these guys are? You know, like they're pretending to be friendly, some of them not pretending very hard, uh, but, uh, you know, some of them seem openly hostile, so we've got reason to think them hostile. Others are pretending to be our friends, but can we really trust that? Are these guys a secret <clears throat> allies of the orcs? Are, you know, I, 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 would, I would think we could have some elves, uh, Noldor or Sindar, who are convinced that the dwarves are evil, you know, that they're agents of Melkor through and through. And I think that it would be most interesting if that, um, if that is defensible, right? Um, and Ellen, I'm not suggesting Finrod doesn't hear from Thingol, but what does Thingol know, right? Thingol knows, remember the Sindar are not 100% dwarf supporters. Remember we had set up a great deal of, they have their doubts, Right? They had their doubts from the beginning. They agreed to become allies and they worked together or tried to work together, but the working together didn't fully pan out. Right, And a lot of green elves got slaughtered as a consequence. So there are a number of... There's, there's, there will be a faction among the, uh, the, the Sindar and an even greater faction among the green elves who are not convinced that the dwarves are really allies. Right? Um, and then among the Noldor, the Noldor are learning all of this by word of mouth, right? They haven't met with them much at all themselves. And 
So yes, and they are not in close contact with Thingol, and Thingol is not going to be disclosing his whole mind to almost any of the Noldor except for Finrod and his uh, and his family. Uh, but again, and so there's still there's still there's a lot of like not everybody knows everything, and and a lot of you know my, my, uh, what's that phrase? More is guessed than was known, right? Um, that's going to be true about yeah, that, a lot that, of this stuff. To me, this doesn't seem like this this. Uh, like like one this doesn't seem all this mysterious or confusing uh and two this seems more than consistent with with the way um each of these races and characters were depi- or depicted in the the published Silmarillion like nobody tells everybody everything right and exactly. like the dwarves definitely like i think even in having productive commerce with um, with uh, the Sindar and the and certain groups of the Noldor, there's no reason why you know they, that could easily just mean that they show up, they provide whatever goods that they were uh, um, commissioned to produce, they take their payment, they leave. Uh, there doesn't have to be like then they go out drinking, you know, they're not drinking buddies or hanging out or. Right. Um, these the other there's these other beings really good at making stuff. Um, they don't cause us too much trouble. We don't really know much. And then from Thingol to the Noldor, I mean, that guy's definitely not having deep, intimate um, um, uh, conversations with any of the Noldor. So I, I, th- I think this really just boils down to, I think this easily like can be explained by a lot of just, you know, f- folks e- not knowing and then not, not disclosing. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, this is a major thing that I think in this season in particular is going to be really important. I've been, I've, I've talked about this almost every day this week in different broadcasts, but um, uh, we talked about this in the Mallory class actually. And we, I talked about it on Tuesday and exploring the Lord of the Rings. It is so easy to forget how little people know and how hard it is to learn things like that is current events um, in a non not only a non-internet society, but a non-print society, right? I mean, it's without even newspapers, much less the internet or television. Um, there is a people, it takes a long time for people to find out what happened a hundred miles away. And, and, and sometimes they never do. Right. And, uh, and the, the, the possibility of stories getting garbled are much greater. And even when you have a network of people who are attempting actively to communicate with each other and stay in touch, there is still a lot. I mean, when you're only just sending messengers or going on very occasional visits, um, there is a whole lot of, misunderst- of opportunity for misunderstanding, miscommunication, misimpression, uh, and all kinds of other things, right? And People forget this. People forget this all the time. I think this is a, a, in my, you know, as a person who's been receiving questions from Tolkien fans for more than a decade now, and, you know, one of, it's one of the patterns I can say that I see, one of the biggest patterns that I see in the questions that people ask about Tolkien or the sort of the, the, the dilemmas or the confusions that they have, um, is that so often this arises because people forget that this it, it, not everybody knows this stuff you know it's um people forget how little is actually known about the rings of power even among the wise you know in the um in the third age i don't want to open that can of worms and talk about that right now but I mean, that's just one big example where this comes up probably most but in the Silmarillion, we're going to see this all the time and so the mere fact that like if we have established certain things like we, we, we have established in our discussions, we have established that there is a genuine desire for goodwill on the part in general, especially of the dwarves of Belagost and of the Sindar. Okay. But not everybody understands that, right? Not everybody sees it that way. There are good reasons for even the participants on the ground to have contrary opinions to that. Uh, and certainly the people who are not involved with that will know almost nothing about that. I mean, think about if one of the Noldor talks to one of the Sindar who was at the battle and, and the, that Sindar tells him that the story and says like, you know, the dwarves didn't show up like they were supposed to. That's perfectly true. Right. 
Um, he doesn't know why not. He may not. He may disbelieve the reasons he's been told as to why they didn't show up on time, and so he's just telling the Noldor what was what is to him a fact, first person observed fact, right? That the dwarves, uh, at the very least, sandbagged it at the at the at that battle, if not actively betrayed them, right? And so now this Noldor goes and he's going to tell other people, yeah, watch out for these short hairy guys, like they're not to be trusted, right? I, I, you know, and that's, and then I, I mean, anyway, like we, we have to make, make it clear. There is no consensus. There is no centralized place where everybody's learning all of this stuff. And Hakan, exactly as you say, dwarves don't even speak Elvish properly, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's. Elves certainly don't speak Dwarvish. Exactly. There's a language barrier there. Uh, you know, it's hard for them to, hard for them to understand. Um, also, we can we can easily construe, you know, a statement like, you know, whether a friendship friendship between these peoples that 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 could be easily construed as there was friendship between like two people, <laughs> right? right? Right. Like there could be there could be a policy of non aggression and like you know open trade and like you know and and sort of like like at the high level like we want to have a productive relationship there could be folks on the ground who who you know genuinely there could be like the one noldor dude who really knows a lot about dwarves mm -hmm. but maybe the dwarves make him promise not to tell anyone else right you know maybe he in in his appreciation maybe he learns a lot about the dwarves but in his appreciation and genuine friendship for them he respects their culture of secrecy Right. So he doesn't, right. tell, so anybody he doesn't tell anybody else. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I agree. And this is actually what I really love about the Norn character. I really like how the Norn character grew over the course of season three. I thought he was uh, one of the coolest original characters uh, that we have introduced into the story so far, in my opinion. And that's what I like about him is that here we have Norn, the one like legitimately friendly dwarf, like the, the, the one of all of the dwarves, the one dwarf who really wants to make it work, who's really trying to do his best while remaining faithful to his people and not betraying their secrets or, or doing things that uh, at least most of his kin wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't disapprove of still he's, he's, um, he's good intentioned. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean he's speaking for every. I mean, he's literally speaking for everybody. But that doesn't mean he represents everybody's opinion. Um, and and I think that we should develop relationships, personal friendships between Norn and some of the elves. Um, who, by the way, who would you, who who would we think Norn's like BFF among the elves would be? Mablung. That seems One like of the a Sindar, good right? Like a good Probably yeah. not. Probably not Beleg. I think I, I'm thinking because. Uh, but Mablung would be my would be my vote. Yeah. Yeah, I like this. Marie one. agrees. Nick agrees. Okay. Yeah. Hakan. All right. Good. We have some kind of consensus. Um, yeah. By the way, re returning to our our previous point, so let's continue belaboring that. Hakan does make a good point that that we may need. Maybe there's things that we can do on screen to convey. The to convey the fact that that information doesn't flow freely and there's no internet <laughs> seems like an absurd thing to say. But I was thinking, reflecting on that point, I was thinking that is one thing that I think George R. R. Martin does quite well in the Ice and Fire series. Like you know, because he's so concerned with sort of of the historicity of his mm -hmm. of his story, he actually does. You know, he 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 he. Um, he portrays the fog of war well. He portrays like yes. the, the the TV series and later seasons less successfully, but even the early seasons of the TV series, you know, where you they spend an entire series on a or entire season of the show marching from one one place to another and stuff. Right. Like I, I think George R. R. Martin does that well, and that's something maybe we need to be mindful of. Like we need to we need to intentionally portray the fact that not everybody knows everything all the time. Yeah, exactly. No, and I, I agree. That's actually that is something that um, uh, that Martin does really well. Not only depicting you know how long it takes to travel and all that stuff, but also the fact that we have like there, there, he'll have whole subplots which have people like doing things on what the reader knows to be false information, right, or or outdated yeah. information, right? But they don't know that yet, and there's no way that they could know that. Um, uh, it, I, I think that's, and, and honestly, that's sort of the difference. The reason I think that people often make this mistake with Tolkien is not that Tolkien himself overlooked it, but that he often didn't make a big deal of it, right? He doesn't, 
Yeah, you know, it's just talk like about not his thing. Much. Yeah, exactly. And and what's more, he um he doesn't most of the times where it's really important are in like history. You know, again, it's like questions for things like why didn't the Council of the Wise do more about the rings between here and there? Because they didn't know, right? But again, we didn't. We anyway. So it's um, rarely is it a, a central plot point for Tolkien in his actual narrative as he's working forward with it. Um, but uh, but it is it is something, especially in season four. This has to be something of a spotlight for us, right? Different people knowing different levels of things, and more importantly, or I should say perhaps as importantly, speculating that speculation amounting closer and closer to fact in the minds of certain people, right? I mean, we need to, dep- we need to be, and this is something that's, we're going to have to be really careful about. There will be certain people and certain like geographic groups of people who have a certain set of beliefs. It might, it might, even, um, it might even behoove us to make some kind of chart or something, right? Before we begin the plotting of the seasons, uh, make some kind of chart of like who believes what, right? Um, what, what you know? I I can imagine a big uh, a big like table, right, with like characters or like groups of people, uh, you know, going down uh, and then across the columns to be like subjects. So like, what do these people believe to be true about the kinslaying, about the dwarves, about you know all these other things? Um, you know, uh, Thingol and like who he is and what's up with him, you know, and because keeping track of that, keeping track of who knows what and who believes what um, is, I think, going to be really important and is going to is something that could be if we do it right, could drive some really, really fun and important storylines, I think, over the course of this season. Um, but it would be really easy for us to just leave it all super muddy um, if we if we're not careful about it. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, good. Um, it is true. Lest we, uh, Hakan makes a good point. Lest we, lest we don't give Tolkien enough credit. It is true that in the, in the, in the return of the King, after the party splits up, or I guess actually, um, two towers as well, after the party splits up, he does, he, you know, there are multiple instances where characters find themselves wondering what the other characters are doing. So we should give him some credit. Oh yeah. But, oh, yeah. No, again, but it I mean, wasn't it. Yeah. But certainly in the Silmarillion and other places, it isn't typically made like an explicit plot point where like characters make a, an important strategic decision based on ignorance. Exactly. And it's, yeah, that's exactly my, my, my point. My point is not at all to say that Tolkien doesn't think about these things. My point is that yeah. my very point is that Tolkien does think about these things it's just that he doesn't make such a big deal of it that readers always remember these things. <laughs> readers are the ones who, who overlook it uh, and who forget about it. I, I think that Tolkien rarely lost sight of these kinds of things. Um, mm. Yeah, Ellen, I agree. In the fifth battle, it's important, right? But even there, you know, you, again, you sort of think about um, th- the plan doesn't work out, right? That is the, the whole debacle of the near Nith Arnoidiad. Um, it's not, I mean, it fails in coordination and it doesn't pan out the way they expected. But even there, you don't have, um, I, I, honestly, I guess I think, I think I would say the place where we probably come closest to the kind of thing that Dave and I are talking about right now, the kind of thing that we're saying that George R. R. Martin does really well, um, or, you know, or, or, and I would say not only does really well, but also conveys really forcibly to the reader. Um, is the Battle of Five Armies, actually. When the elves and dwarves are about to, like, our shots are exchanged, right? And they're about to clash on the battlefield before Gandalf does his thing and stands up in the middle of them and says, hey, the goblins are here. How about we all work together? That moment of the dwarves coming f- and they're, they're thinking in one way and they they have this one set of this one understanding about what's going on here. And the elves and humans have this other understanding of what's going on there. And they're, they're not exact. Neither one of them is exactly wrong, but they're both of them sort of skewed and neither one of them is really thinking, um, you know, seeing the big picture here. That's, that's, that's like, that's, that's the kind of thing. And that is the issue, the sort of issue that's going to be, important all over the place and in really complicated ways. Um, and that's what we mean about the lack of information and the lack of communication and the size of the continent and, uh, uh, and the way that all this stuff is going to come in. The fact that, um, you know, a, 
um, a Noldor, right? The fact that a Noldor, uh, uh, you know, one of the Noldor does not, uh, you know, gets to know the truth about the dwarves doesn't mean all the Noldor, Noldor know about it. Even if he doesn't agree to, like, keep their secrets. Uh, even if he goes around telling every single other Noldor he meets, you know, every other single other Noldor he meets, he's not going to... Uh, make a big impact, very likely, right, on the overall cultural understanding of the dwarves by the Noldor, right? I mean, that's just not how it works. Um, so, anyhow, anyhow. Um, uh, yeah, that chart's a good idea, actually. The more I think about it, the more I think that would be really excellent, actually. Um, uh, let's, uh, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should see if we can, uh, if it, you guys on the discussion board should work on that table. Uh, and then maybe we can do an episode talking about, you know, sort of reviewing that before we start our storylines. That'd be really cool. Um, but um, anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, Nick, you're right. We, we would have to update it as we went along, but I'm thinking of it e- even less as a tracking for the episodes as we do the story. I think it would really help us to, work out specific stories. And in particular, one of the things that I'm not, that I see so much less clearly in this season than I have in other seasons, you know, again, cause it's so much less linear is how do we pace it? You know, how do we, how do we, how do we interleave all of these stories, uh, as we go through? So, um, yeah. Uh, anyhow, so, um, let's, uh, let's, Let's move on to the next slide. How about that? Let's talk about the petty doors. Yeah, great. Okay. <laughs> Make steady progress. Make steady progress. I, this is often, I often get caught on those overview slides at the beginning and like, let's talk for the entire episode about you know, the entire session about the things that are on this one slide. Uh, and then, of course, we have all these details to go into that we then often, uh, uh, anyway, the petty dwarfs. Let's talk about this. So, uh, I think it was, let's see, I, the, the name is not coming through, but I have a shrewd suspicion that, uh, was it Carita? No, Carita's not here today. Somebody was saying we need to talk about the word petty as um, relating to dwarves. Um, and uh, <laughs> I don't know, my uh, uh, go to webinar questions box is acting a little funky. It's still saying waiting for name. So I the person who is listed as waiting for name says that was me. I still can't see who that is. Uh, tell me, t- t- tell me, tell me what your name is so that I can, I can see, we can uh, uh, go past the obfuscation of, Oh, Karita, it is you. And you're Carita, completely yeah. invisible on the attendee list. That's why I thought it was you. Uh, it sounded like you, um, but you don't appear on the list, which is why it says, you're not named. Okay. Anyway, cool. Um, uh, all right. So petty dwarves. First of all, we don't have to use that term if we don't want to. Um, uh, Do we not want to? The word petty is awkward. It's, it's, it's only gotten imagine, more awkward as, as the years have gone by. Imagining watching this on, uh, on a television screen in the 21st century, it, it seems problematic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the petty, um, the word petty, originally, the only common usage of the word petty in its older sense that I can think of is the business usage of petty cash, right? Like if you have a petty uh-huh. cash fund, um, that means like a small pool of cash that you use for, for little small minor expenses, right? So petty in that sense, the, 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 uh, the, the, the cash that you are using for such expensive is not petty in the modern sense, right? It is petty in the older sense, meaning it's, just small bits and pieces here. It's lesser, right? It's, it's not, this is not a grandiose purchase. This is a bunch of small little purchases. Um, and, uh, so as applied to the petty dwarves, 
I don't think it is necessarily meant to be an insult in the way that it sounds like an insult. I'm not saying it's not insulting at all, but I am saying it. I don't think it's the kind of insult that it sounds like to a modern reader, right? This is not the elves thinking that these dwarves are petty in the modern sense. This is like, these are the petty dwarves. It's the lesser subset of dwarves, right? Who are less significant than the other dwarves, right? You know, petty dwarves are to the dwarves of Belagost and Nogrod what expenses in your petty cash fund are to major purchases that you're doing on invoices, right? Like that's, that's the kind of relationship that it, that's what he's suggesting when he calls them petty dwarves. But um, yes, it's more like calling them minor dwarves, Ellen, exactly right. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so um, I agree that, Ellen, even if we try to replace that with um, a, a less complicated term like lesser, like calling them the lesser dwarves, I agree that in a racial context, Ellen calling a, a racial subgroup lesser is still still not a good look, right? I mean, it still has a kind of freight to it, which we can choose to give it. I mean, I, I, I'm not necessarily even arguing that we don't want a name applied to them, which is ultimately racist, right? I mean, it, it's we may choose that we want these dwarves to be given a derogatory name, either by the other dwarves or by the elves or both, right? But we need to be deliberate about how we do that. Right. And we need to think about we need to think through the implications about how we do that. And in any case, I don't think the word petty is going to serve our purposes because the word petty has come. Okay, the other usage, the classic usage of petty, just meaning smaller or lesser is is gone. Nobody uses it that way, except again in petty cash and they don't even know what they're saying. I mean, like, that that term has become so specific uh, as an adjective applied to the word cash that people don't even think about. No one applies that to any other concept I, I, that I yeah. can think of in the modern world. Yeah, I think we I think I think we got to change it. I I think I think I'm currently my sort of first thought is I'm in favor of like this not whatever 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 sort of replacement we come up with for it not being their like pr actual proper racial name but being a specific derogatory term applied by a character that we intend to d depict as as being, you know, racist in some sense, right? Like right. that. So maybe, so we have this storyline that we're bouncing around about. Um, uh, maybe the way that the that Finrod gets Nargothrond is that essentially the dwarves steal it from the petty dwarves and then sell it to him. Right. And so maybe that group of dwarves will, will depict as a, like a little more villainous and and depict their treatment of the petty dwarves as being sort of as as being you know indicative of an attitude of 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 derision and um you know and considering them to be lesser in some sense but i think that's my my feeling is i agree with you like whatever replacement we come up with we should be intentional about depicting it as a derogatory term and that the character we depict using it should be a character we in intend to depict in a negative light like we shouldn't right. have finrod use it for sure right 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 or we can have like two terms because there's the reality is and I, and I know you know untrammeled by the trappings of reality or whatever <laughs> but the reality is I, I think you know i think it's still i think part of what makes this exercise fun is imagining this being a thing that a modern audience would actually watch mm -hmm. there's no way that there's no way that a modern first of all modern like you said a modern audience certainly isn't going to interpret the word petty properly no and and whatever if we if we if we just if we just replace the word petty, but otherwise, you know, kind of use it in the same way that it's used in the book, your standard, you know, Game of Thrones watching modern audience is just going to automatically look and say, well, that's racist. Right. Uh, right. And they're going to think you're racist. Tolkien's racist. The show's racist. So yes. I think I think we have to accept that uh, and, and plan for it. Yeah. And I think I mean. To some extent, of course, like we're already sort of considering that. Like we know we have to treat yeah. this question carefully, especially, I mean, with petty with the petty dwarves, we're not only talking about um, racist conceptualizations, right? Mm -hmm. We're also talking about indigenous peoples' issues, right? 
So, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. This is a, you know, the petty dwarves are a powder keg of like political issues that we need to treat carefully and respectfully. I mean, I don't think we need to duck this. Um, and I don't even think we need to deviate from what Tolkien did. But, uh, you know, Dave, I think you hit it exactly on the head. What we don't want to do is depict this in a way that would enable a modern audience m- mindlessly to dismiss either us or Tolkien as simply racist. Right. It's mm-hmm. not, you know, yep. it's 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 not it's not that we can deal with these issues thoughtfully and 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 carefully. Yeah. We don't yeah. have to, and and it doesn't even mean that we have to that we're like having to be politically correct in some kind of like you know excruciating way, um, but we do need to be thoughtful and and careful and deliberate and show that we are like we're, we're wanting to engage in a really interesting, um, you know, consideration of this question, uh, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. we're not just yeah. chucking things out. Yeah, I think I think I think I think what we're what we're engaged in doing here is. Taking the when whenever your whenever your like non Tolkien reading friend and I'm this is the royal you whenever your non Tolkien right. reading friend makes a claim that Tolkien is racist because of some term X right. and right. then you go into your fifteen X fifteen minute explanation of why that's not so <laughs> right I think I think our adaptation needs to needs to embody the explanation right exactly exactly I, I, I think that's a great way to think about it um so let's. Let's back this conversation up a little bit. Let's start at the beginning. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning. Uh, because we're starting the discussion of the petty dwarves start. in the middle. Now, it was naturally, it, it was very natural for us to jump right into saying, okay, petty dwarves, what the heck are we going to call them and what does that even mean, right? But let's, let's step back for a second. Let's just think the story from the beginning. First, the, let, let's, let's, let's ignore the elves. Let's just talk about the dwarves. How did the petty dwarves become the petty dwarves? Why do we have this division, this particular division? among the dwarves because the thing that is most noteworthy about it is that this is not a division based on clan right the division between the the dwarves of Nogrod and the dwarves dwarves of Belagost is a purely sort of political one right you know, you've got the one family the one clan of dwarves and the other clan of dwarves they may or may not always get along um but they don't consider like it's not neither one of them is uh you know, exiled. There's no stigma. Yeah, again, they, they they might not agree. They might not always like each other. I'm sure there are dwarves who live in Belagost and Nogrod who are uh, dead set against the other clan. Like that probably happens. But still, they're on equal terms, right? The petty dwarves, in in as much as like by being called petty dwarves, it is clear that they are marginalized in some way, right? They are separated from the other dwarves and looked down upon by the other dwarves, right? Um. So, um, our idea that we, so, and now we did some of this thinking last season, of course, when we were going to introduce this and then decided against it. Um, and the idea that we had was that the, the petty dwarves have been exiled, right? So they are dwarves originally from different clans. Like there, there can be dwarves whose families originally came from Belagost and Nogrod, both among the petty dwarves. And this also explains why they are living in some of these now uncomfortable places, like Nargothrond, right? They're not living in the ancestral centers anymore. They, they're not in Nagra and Belgas. The reason why we're running into random dwarves who have set up their own homes here in the places where the elves are settling down is that they've been booted out of the dwarvish homelands, right? So they're exiles, and we decided, we decided this, was a, this was a criminal sentence, Right, they've been banished. They've been stripped of their clan and and banished because of some wrongdoing. Did we decide what for? Like simple crime or political reasons? Like, are the it's just is this like this is what happens? Like if you're convicted of murder or something, right? If you 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 commit some, you're convicted of crime by whatever the dwarvish judicial process is. One of the sentences can be exile in this way, right? Um. Uh, which, of course, is nice because that brings us squarely into the forgiveness and reconciliation theme of season four, right? Uh, the uh, this because this notion with the elf with, is the elves don't do this, right? Elves don't exile other elves. Right? 
we don't really have that. Um, this could be, um, um, This could be, hmm, okay. I'm thinking of a cultural gap here between the elves and the dwarves, right? I'm thinking that the elves would probably look at this and be a little shocked, right? How is it that you, you know, so for instance, I'm imagining a conversation where after the elves, like say some of the Sindar encounter, so let's, let's, let's make it personal. Let's imagine Mablung, right? So here's Mablung and he, you know, he goes, he, he, he goes traveling. He's man of the world, right? So he goes out and he meets one of the petty dwarves and he's like, oh, hey, dwarves. Yeah, I know dwarves. I hang out with dwarves all the time. And he's like, no, 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 I, 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 and he would be really closed mouthed about it. A, because he's a dwarf and B, because he's, you know, been condemned and doesn't probably want to talk about it. So he'd be like, oh yeah, uh, hi, this is awkward. I'm going to leave now. And then Mabon goes back to his friend Norn. So the next time he and his friend Norn are having a pint or whatever it is they have, uh, he's like, hey, Norn, I met this other dwarf, right? Maybe he's a relative of yours. Do you know him? Like he lives over here. And Norn is like, you know, he is dead to us. Like he is not one of us. He is not, he is not a true dwarf. You know, he is, he is no longer, um, so he, Norn would have to explain. And, and he would be like, you know, he's like, he is dead to us. We, we, we don't consider him one of our people anymore. And I would think that in that situation, right, um, Mablung would be puzzled, right? He would, because this, this isn't a thing that the elves really do. Um, so he would be puzzled by this. This, of course, would be then really interesting. Because, of course, Nick, is exactly as you say, they don't have that much of a crime issue, the elves, right? Um, I don't think we're going to have a whole lot of elf murder, you know, murder trials and things going on in your average year, you know, uh, in, like, the Court of Thingol. Um, not none, though. I mean, remember Cyros, Right. I mean, uh, with elves like Cyros around, there have to be murders because, you know, it'd be hard to live with a guy like that for too long without wanting to kill him. So uh, anyway, you know, what I'm saying is obviously elves are not all perfect acting, uh, um, uh, it, you know, uh, it decorously towards each other at all times. Um, the point is, notice how we could use this as a setup for the kinslang, Right. The elves are like, oh, we all just get along. I could never imagine, like, condemning some of your kin like that and exiling them and, and saying that they're dead to me. And then the kinslaying comes out, right? And it's like, oh, okay, so uh, now how about that reconciliation with the Noldar, right? And I could even think that if we make Norn live long enough, which might be a stretch, but let's not worry about that for, for, the, for the moment. Uh, we're not thinking about an actual sequ sequence. But again, imagining... Mablung and Norn, just as my sample elf and dwarf hanging out and having a pint, um, after the kinslaying comes out and Mablung and, and Norn are talking about it over their pint, be like, oh man, those Noldor, I can't believe it, right? That's why we want nothing to do with those Noldor ever again. And then Norn would be like, aha, see, just like the petty dwarves, right? So you do get it, right? Um, and that would be awkward, Right. And then it would cause people like Mablung, uh, you know, elves like Mablung to then have to uh, deal with the fact that, OK, actually, maybe they're not so much different or really like, uh, you know, that, you know, or at least it's a challenge to their to their outlook. Um, so anyhow, I'm uh, so Ellen, for this reason, I am thinking that, yes, the revelation about exile it would be best, I think, if the revelation about the exile occurred before the kinslaying is revealed to the Sindar. So that we could already have that. Because, again, I think it'd be cool, right, if the Sindar were all like, oh, poo-poo, we would never treat our kin like that. That's awful. And then, of course, the kin slaying comes and push comes to shove, right? Um, I think that'd be, that would be cool. Um, so, now, a couple of you are talking about... Um, a couple of you are talking about uh, arms dealing to the orcs, right, as something that the petty dwarves did. My question is, I think we talked about this before. When we talked about this before... Was that a before or after thing? Were we th suggesting that the petty dwarves were exiled because they dealt arms to the orcs, or that they started dealing arms to the orcs after they were exiled? The latter seems to me totally understandable, right? The first seems uh, more 
um, challenging, right? Um, uh, yeah, the first game's a little bit more challenging. That is to say, it's a pretty strong statement, I think. Uh, that is, it would be a very strong statement of the allegiances of the dwarves. If the, like, the crime that led to exile was selling arms to the orcs, right? Um, I'm not saying we don't necessarily make that, and maybe we do. Uh, I mean, I, I could imagine it being part of our character development of Azakal to imagine Azakal making the decree, right? Being like, you know, Azakal has no truck with Melkor or any of his servants, and so he decrees that in his kingdom, any dwarf who makes arms uh, for the orcs of Melkor will be, you know, cast out from the clan. Um, I could, I could see it, but again, it's a very strong statement, but I could see us having Azakal make that. Um, and is this the, is this the kind of thing where, um, you'd have a, a, a sweeping policy in that where a whole bunch of, uh, innocent petty dwarves might get caught up in it, you know, like their cousin sells arms to the, to the orcs. And so then their entire family gets, uh, exiled. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Possibly. Like, I'm kind of liking the idea that maybe Meme wasn't involved in any particular criminal activity. Right. That he's right. like more of a victim. Yeah, and we have the chronology problem. Um, let's come back to that. I'm not going to talk about that right now. Right now, we'll we'll come back to the Good. Meme yeah. question Punt. later on. Um, punt. Uh, well, uh, not quite punt. I'm just going to defer that a little bit. <laughs> I want to talk about the larger, I want to get the larger political issues down first. Um, let's think about timing. Ellen is suggesting the petty dwarves have to be exiled before the orcs show up. Mm, does that have to be so? Hmm. What events mandate that within our storyline is there anything in the season three storyline that mandates because we removed the petty dwarves entirely from our season three plot line yeah maria exactly i agree it depends on how long they've been in nargothrond <sighs> my impulse is to have them not be very long in nargothrond I, yeah, I want them to be newly established. My, my impulse is to make them newly established in Nargothrond. Um, cause there are two, two, there are two options here. Okay. There's lots of options, but I, I can see it's going in two ways with Nargothrond, right? For e either the petty doors have been established there for generations, right? And they're getting kicked out. And so this is a grievance because like, this is like, this is their homeland, right? Um, on the other hand, if they're we could still if they're relatively newly settled there, we could still make it a great tragedy for them, right? So here's the petty dwarves who have not been exiled for very long, and they, you know, here's the story that I'm imagining: we have a bunch of dwarves who have been exiled separately, right? And they've been wandering Middle Earth, and slowly over the last few years, they've been kind of they've 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 been gathering, right? And so Nargothrond is the first time any of them have ever, ever gathered. So this is the, the petty dwarves coming together and saying, okay, we, the exiled ones, are going to finally make a, lives for our, for a life for ourselves. We have lost our, uh, our homeland. We've been wandering. We've been, we've been homeless. We've been forgeless. Uh, right. What do we now? Finally, we have found a place where we can set up our new, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to leave the old world behind. We're going to establish a new dwarvish homeland. Here it is the land of the new, uh, clanless dwarves. We're going to establish a new clan and, uh, you know, a, a brave new tradition down to our, uh, down to our, our children and their children. And this is the new, you know, so Belagost and Nogrod are dead to us. This is the new homeland of our dwarves. And then the other dwarves come and kick them out. Right. Uh, like next year after they've just begun to establish that, that sound, that seems to me like a pretty good story, right? I don't think that they need to have been there for a long time for them to really resent being kicked out of it. Right. Because as a result, 
they've lost it, right? And Amon Ruth then would become their place, but it's much lesser, right? They don't have, and while they're there, so now in Amon Ruth, in Meme's house, right? In the place which is going to become Meme's house when he's the only one left, um, uh, that's still much, much lesser than Nargothron, right? So they're going to spend now their whole time, they're still going to have a place, but it's not going to be like the old place, right? And it will never be like they, they you know, so their dreams of establishing a great new homeland and a great center um, are going to be, because they, instead they're cramped into this small place and many of them are still left wandering. And, and so, yeah, I think it's, um, uh, I, I, I think that I personally, I think that's a pretty cool, uh, a pretty cool story, even if they haven't been there for very long. So, um, and in some ways I kind of like that better because it's, it's not just, here's why I like that story better than the idea of them having been there for generations. I'm thinking about meme. Of course, when I'm thinking about the petty dwarves. I'm always thinking about meme and thinking about meme and memes grievances, right? I think that the most compelling story is if memes grievances are somewhat, but not entirely justified, right? Um, if the petty dwarves had in fact successfully established Nargothrond or what will become Nargothrond as their ancestral home, right? Um, and what we have is just a displaced indigenous people's subplot, right? Then meme is in that extent, to that extent anyway, like purely tragical, right? or, or in a sense like purely heroic, like he's entirely in the right. Um, and the elves are entirely in the wrong, though we're going to fiddle with that too. Um, I think it would be if memes, if the things that meme says about Nargothrond are justified and justifiable, but not completely dead on, right? Um, it never was actually the home. It never became the homeland of the petty dwarves, but they wanted it to be right. Then he has a real grievance. It's not true that they've been kicked out of their ancestral land because it's not their ancestral place yet. Right. It's just the place that they wanted to make into their ancestral place. Still a totally legitimate grievance and still something that you can see somebody way down the road like meme still harboring a serious grievance about, right? Because the petty dwarves as a people have been saying, what if ever since that time, right? And all of the bad things that have happened to them since they can, they can set to the score of being kicked out of Nargothrond, right? Um, so I really, really like that. But, but again, it's not his claim, his, his claim on Nargothrond, Right when he goes to Nargothrond and sets himself up in Nargothrond and is like, "I have finally your story." That should not really be a homecoming, right? I mean, again, he's he's kind he's still he has a point, but he's also kind of deluded about it. I want there to be two sides to it. If do you, do you see what I mean? Is that clear, Dave? You see what I mean by that? Yes, yes. Those are always the most interesting stories. Yeah, he has a he has a legitimate grievance, but he's not absolutely right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Exactly, Nick. It should ring hollow. It should even look a little bit ridiculous, in in, in I, c carefully ridiculous, uh, when Meme claims lordship, right, and says that he's coming into his rightful inheritance, right. There, it's there. There, there should be all kinds of like footnotes attached to, it, you know, that the viewer is 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 attaching to his claim of coming into his inheritance, right. Um, and yes, Ellen, that's one of the things that I want to be really sen sensitive to. Exactly as you say, we don't want Finrod Felagund merely to look like a colonizer. That's that's it's that's not the, I mean, that's part of the story, right? That that's certainly to the petty dwarves. That's what it's going to look like, and that's the claim that they're going to make. Um, and I think it will be much more interesting if that claim is partly, but not entirely, justifiable. Right. I think I think what we're what we're seeking is a, a story that's um, that's tragic, and that from any one person's point of view, sort of understandable, and that there's 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 char there are characters you know like the petty dwarves who are victims, but not victims of a specific individual villain. You know, mm -hmm. they're kind of victims of like a compl complicated action of circumstances yes and yes. you know I, I don't know maybe the maybe the dwarves in the middle are kind of 
are maybe the dwarves in the middle are are sort of villainous, but not we don't want them to be completely villainous. So, right, right. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, as for the arms dealing question, uh, that is the question about whether that was their um, whether that was their crime or not. I don't think we need to decide totally in favor one way or the other. First of all, we don't have to show this. Like, we don't have to show on screen dwarves being exiled. Um, we might choose to do that as a way to bring up the topic rather than just doing it in exposition, right? We could have, uh, for instance, I can imagine a scene where uh, the real focus of our scene is Norn coming in to have a conversation with, like, Azakal or something, Right. And so we follow Norn into Belagost and it gives us a chance to show Belagost, which is awesome. And then we, you know, he comes into the audience chamber you know, into the into the in, into the great hall of Azakal, And we see Azakal like court is still happening. Right. And he is there condemning some dwarves who have been convicted. And he says, you have been convicted of this and I cast you out and you were stripped of clan and everything. And then they leave. And then afterwards, you know, he go, uh, you know, Norn is like, Hey King, if you're done with that now, let's go talk. And then they go and have their conversation. Right. So, um, uh, that's, um, uh, just one random example that I think of off the top of my head, a way that we could introduce the issue of, uh, dwarvish banishments and show that it's current, that it's an ongoing thing, that it's not just a, at one point in time, there was like a civil war and some people were kicked out. Um, but rather that this is a, a steady state, you know, this is a thing that the dwarves do, um, within their culture. Now, Philip, <clears throat> Philip number seven, uh, on the Twitch chat points out that if the crime was murder, it makes the kinslaying connection stronger, which is true. Um, and I, I don't think there needs to be one single crime. Um, I kind of, I, th- I, I, the more I've thought about it, the more I actually like Azakal being so firmly in the anti Melkor camp that he would kick out any dwarf who was caught selling arms to the orcs. Um, but I don't think that should be the only one. I mean, if we imagine that uh, by Azakal's decree, uh, selling arms to the orcs is a, maybe it's not in Nogrod, but it is in Belgost, a crime that's punishable by exile. Um, and murder can certainly be punishable by exile. We have every reason to believe, of course, based on how Tolkien depicts the dwarves, that murder would be a rather more common crime among the dwarves than it is among the elves, um, with their t- more their their greater tendency towards vengefulness and their uh, uh, sort of more violently jealous temperaments. Uh, uh, you know, this seems to fit with how dwarves are depicted by Tolkien. Um, anyhow, so. Um, uh, yeah, and Marie, I agree. If we do have a discussion between Maglor and Norn about this, if this is, comes up in an actual conversation between Maglor and Norn, um, Norn could give examples of crimes that are worthy of banishment. <clears throat> Dealings with Melkor and murder could be two examples that he doesn't have to be, um, you know, the, the full list, but, but that would work. Did I say Maglor? I meant Mablung. Yeah, sorry. And by the way, Get used to that for the next few years. I'm going to say Mablung when I or Maglor when I say when I mean Mablung all the time. That's I do that constantly. My fault. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so just, please, please please try to take what you think I mean, not not when uh, what I'm actually saying. Um, but no, anyway, we're going to correct every single time. Yeah, yeah I appreciate that. That, um, that won't uh, that won't get tiresome at all. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, um, anyway, yeah, no, I agree. Exile is milder than execution. And if you think about it, this actually makes total sense within dwarf culture, right? Because if the punishment for murder is execution, then the kinsmen of the dwarf executed are likely to want to take vengeance for their kin, right? Um, so the whole cycle of violence, the whole, you know, cycle of vengeance thing, um, is likely to be a big, so this could be, a dwarvish innovation, uh, again, maybe this is even Azakal's innovation, right? Uh, to say, hey, look, let's short circuit the cycle of vengeance by instead of, me, you know, uh, 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 rewarding bloodshed with bloodshed and therefore perpetuating the bloodshed and the desire for more bloodshed, we do exile instead, right? And of course, in some so that would be a more of a deterrent for dwarves because exile would be worse than execution. Um, you know, being stripped of your clan and your identity would be worse and, and being kicked out from your forge and everything. 
um, would be worse for dwarves than death. But then also it prevents the it prevents the family of the uh, uh, of the murderer from then, you know, holding further grudges. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, oh, by the way, let me, um, let, <laughs> let me address one issue very, very briefly. And I'm not going to talk about it anymore. A couple people have raised, very legitimately, raised the issue that Tolkien talked about on a couple of occasions of the connections between the dwarves as a people and the Jews as a people. I have three words for that. Ten foot pole. I am not <laughs> touching that with a ten foot pole. Okay? Like, yeah. that's it. I'm not even talking about that anymore. Now, I, 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 it's not that I'm unwilling to talk about this in general, but I am not going to digress onto that here in, the, in these podcast discussions. And I am not going to go there. I'm not going to go within ten miles of that connection. And because if there is one thing that is guaranteed to be misunderstood, it's that. So forget it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, I, uh, I, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Whew. All right. Done. Um, so the exile of the, of the clanless dwarves, um, will be an ongoing thing and the establishment of the, and, and, and uh, the establishment of the, of the, the petty dwarves in Nargothrond should be a very recent thing. Um, again, them have, so, which means we need to establish this somehow. We need to, est- we need to make sure that we make it clear. Um, we need to make sure that we make it clear what Nargothrond meant to them. You know, this whole story that I was talking about, about like, you know, them being able to reconstruct themselves as the eighth clan of the dwarves and, and, and you know, their, their new homeland and ancestral home um, that they were hoping to, to, to forge for themselves. And it's now being stripped of them. We need to make that clear. We probably don't need to do it in advance. We can probably have that come up in conversation. Like that can be explained by the petty dwarves at the time, right? When they're being asked to move the heck out of Nargothrond. Um, and they will explain quite clearly why that uh, doesn't uh, uh, suit them at all. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, hang on. Ellen wants to move a step back, and this is very sensible. This is exactly the kind of question that we should be asking at this point. So let's... Let's, at the risk of diverting ourselves for the entire rest of the session, let's do this. Oh, boy. She, she asks, why is it that dwarves should be more inclined to do things like commit murder than elf? Like, what is it about the dwarves? Um, are they... F- so, with the humans we're going to make a kind of a big deal about the fact that there's like something dark in their past, right? There's, there, there's a fall of man that has occurred that Melkor orchestrated um, out in the distance and off screen, right? And here thinking about this, in the abstract and not, again, this is not necessarily us uh, thinking about like what we're going to actually, that we don't need to necessarily discuss this, you know, in dialogue, but (sighs) here's my thought. I think with the dwarves, it has to come down to Aule's blueprint, right? Um, This seems to me a logical, so remember that, um, the seven rings of power that Sauron makes don't work on the dwarves, right? They don't have the intended effect. His hope was to bring them to subdue, to use the rings of power to subdue their wielders entirely to his will, to wraithify them and enslave them. Uh, this worked uh, excellently to the nine humans to whom he gave rings of power. This failed for the dwarves to whom he gave rings of power, right? Um, and the reason it failed is because of Aule's blueprint, right? When Aule designed the dwarves, 
He designed them precisely to be resistant to domination of this kind. He was thinking about Melkor and knowing that he was going to that that his dwarves would be facing a world in which, you know, evil existed and Melkor was trying to dominate things and he did not want his children. Uh, Ali did not want his children falling under the domination of Melkor. So he designed them specifically to and 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 Sauron underestimated this, right? Um, uh, Sauron, I, uh, I uh, did not understand the full implications of Aule's blueprint on the dwarves, and this is why the Seven Rings of Power ultimately were pretty much a failure, and Sauron put out the recall order on them, right? So I'm thinking that one of the sort of side effects, right? Like, so when Aule designs the dwarves, he designs them to be tough. He designs them to be resistant. Um, this means one of the side effects of this is that they're also stubborn um, and stiff-necked, uh, to use a dangerous word. Um, but, uh, you know, this is a, a word, of course, from the Lord of the Rings. Um, anyway, so... Uh, um, th- again, that's one. So the, 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 the ways in which the dwarves are like pugnacious and stuck in their ways is kind of, uh, uh, and like secretive and, and, uh, and not wanting to share and everything is sort of a natural side effect of the way that Aule designed them to be like tough and resistant to outside influence, right? Because there's a good side to that and there's a bad side to that. Similarly, he designed them to be fierce and undaunted, right? So that they would not be intimidated by, and if Melkor came after them, they would stand up to him and they would be able to, he wanted his people to be able to defend themselves against Melkor and the servants of Melkor in a hard world, right? Again, that's part of the blueprint of Aule for the dwarves. But again, there are side effects of that, right? The, that has both positive and negative manifestations. So fierceness, so that, 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 that tendency towards vengefulness, uh, you know, to not stand for it when somebody tries to do you wrong, that's part of the blueprint of how they're supposed to, they're supposed to feel that way towards Melkor, right? To be resistant to Melkor and not to, uh, to, to submit to him and not to put up, not, not to, not to put up with any guff from his servants, right? And yet it has some negative cultural side effects as well. And it makes them much more likely to take offense at their, you know, their fellows, right? To fight amongst each other, um, to uh, act like Thor and Oakenshield, right? <laughs> when, once he gets to the mountain. Um, uh, these things are, um, uh, that, that seems like kind of the, uh, the, the picture, right? Um, yeah, so Ellen, I would say exactly... Exactly what you said in your second part there. Um, Alley ended up with unintended trade-offs as a result. Yes. I think that what we're seeing here, these kind of negative impacts on the dwarves, are... Alley... Alley was overstepping his bounds when he made the dwarves, right? Um, he was following the inclination of his heart to make things, but as Iluvatar makes clear to him, he's operating above his pay grade here, Right? he does not actually have the capability to, you know, so there are flaws in the design of his children, right? His children aren't, they are not what Iluvatar might have made them to be had Iluvatar been making them himself, right? They have blind spots because Aule had blind spots and he did this on his own. He didn't even get his wife's help. If he had gotten together with his wife, maybe, and said like, hey, let's the two of us make some children, right? Right? That would be much more normal, right? That would be uh, that I begin the whole marriage of Aule and Yavanna is really evocative and suggestive, and the fact that Aule and Yavanna operated separately, right, with both the dwarves and the ants, has consequences, right? Um, so <laughs> yeah, exactly. Marie says, "Don't make kids without your wife." Pro tip. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. It's it's, it's not going to end well. I promise. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, but um, uh, but yeah, Ellen. I actually ex- exactly. I, I think that uh, the ants and and potentially the eagles. Not sure exactly how the eagles. Ne- how we want to make the eagles necessarily fit into this, but yeah, I think that the ants have issues too. 
different issues, right? Um, but uh, but unintended consequences, right? I think in the ends and in the need of the ends to get roused and how slow they are to get roused and everything, I think that's one of the unintended consequences in the same sort of way that the ends are sort of designed with blind spots, right? With, again, negative flip sides to positive things that Yovana gave them, right? Um, uh, and just like just like with, with the dwarves. So, um, anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah. Anyway, so so th- to me, this kind of this kind of works, right? And because remember, this seems to me even something like this, I think, could be understood to be implicit in the Luvatar's statement to Aule, right? When he's like, "Well, and as they are, so you know, they will be," right? He sort of implies, like, you know, there's some. I'm not gonna. He, he says, "I'm not gonna amend your work. I'm gonna leave them as they are." Um, in part, of course. I think that refers to the stature. I mean, you know, the the Avali and Yavanna chapter suggests clearly that one of the reasons the dwarves are just proportioned differently from the elves and and, and is that um, Ali didn't have a clear idea of what you know, he had a bit he, he had a basic idea, right? Okay, he was like, okay, bipeds, right? I'm pretty sure on the biped thing, uh, uh, you know, and I, but but you know, he didn't get all the proportions right. It doesn't mean that his craftsmanship was flawed in the sense of. You know, they they just they were messed up. It's just that his the his model was not complete, right? It wasn't perfect. Again, I think that their characters can be sort of similar in that way. Um, so that's my long answer, Ellen, to your excellent question of why should the dwarves have more of a murder problem in their culture than the elves have in their culture? Um, now, does this ever come out? You know, do people ever talk about this? I don't know that they do, right? I, I don't know uh, if or how we ever discuss this as, as of course, <clears throat> most everybody uh, involved in season four doesn't have any idea that, you know, even about the making of the dwarves necessarily, right? Or Aule's involvement at all. So, um, uh, anyway, so there we are. Um, okay. Does that, does that make sense? Does that seem satisfactory, Dave? Yeah, I like this. I like this. I like this direction we're heading in. Um, and I and I think it's. I mean, it's always whenever you start having conversations like this about a race of beings, even fictitious, it's always tricky. But but I do like you know. But I like the idea of uh, even in the case of the elves of like of like you know having an understanding that these are not perfect beings. Uh, but the, and they're not unidimensional. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, and and Dave, you're absolutely right. I mean, again, the whole like the entire concept of that general statements like this are in fact held to be true of a race of creatures, right? Is a really freighted and difficult thing to talk about, right? In the modern world, um, and in that, and and it is in that sense by the way, that one can say, and I think this is a this is an important thing to acknowledge when having that conversation that you were talking about, Dave, when people want to say that Tolkien is racist, is to acknowledge that in some ways, uh, like, there is racism inherent in Tolkien's creation, right? I mean, he does say that, like, dwarves in particular are, a, like, dwarves in general are a particular way. And, you know, hobbits in general are a particular way. Nobody seems to have a problem with that one, right? Um... You know, saying that uh, it's not, it's racist to say that, you know, hobbits, you know, all like have a close relationship with the earth and, you know, enjoy seven meals a day. Like that's a racist statement about hobbits. Um, True. People don't have a problem with that. Right. But um, anyway, uh, exactly, Nick. That's that, that, that's this is why it's such a difficult conversation to have, because. The problem is where where it becomes to- where where the the sort of racism in Tolkien issue becomes completely inappropriate is when people simply want to map that onto. It's not about Nick, as you say, it's not about Europeans versus Africans, right? Um, the the whole conception of Tolkien's world, 
Um, it's why race is such a difficult thing to talk about in Tolkien, because you have to establish whole new sets of definitions. You can, however, back up a step further and say the fact that Tolkien subcreated a world in which there are races with these fundamental racial differences suggests a kind of racist thinking in Tolkien, right? That, uh, like, yes, the things that are untrue, the racist statements that are untrue when made about uh, you know, uh, ethnic groups, you know, like English people and Africans, right, are true um, be between elves and dwarves. Like, you can say that, right? And that's true. But the fact that Tolkien invented a world in which that is true, uh, you know, you could, one could make the argument saying that, that that still is like a tendency towards racist thinking, right? So the argument is complicated. Um, the thing that always frustrates me is when Ultimately, in a sense, it, it kind of comes down to the allegory thing that Tolkien was talking about, right? Like, as if when he's talking, when he's describing orcs, he is describing, you know, like black people, basically, right? Um, when people talk like that, that's when I get really frustrated because they're just, they're not uh, being, you can't be utterly willing, utterly unwilling to invest in Tolkien's secondary world and then claim to make judgments about it, Right. If you're not willing to even think about how his secondary world is constructed, if you're willing to, to, to put no secondary belief at all into his secondary world, to use his right. terminology, then you, that, then you have no grounds upon which to even talk about it. Right. Right. Um, but anyway, I think like, yeah. I think, um, I, I think, I think if people want to discuss, um, you know, sort of racist attitudes toward orcs, in Tolkien, mm -hmm. like I think that's a that's an interesting conversation to have. It is. Like, all, you it know, is. Are in fact all orcs bad? Uh, I think I think yeah I think I think you're right. I think where it becomes problematic is when people automatically uh, um, uh, apply an allegorical interpretation. You know, racist attitudes about orcs as depicted in Tolkien are obviously reflective of his personal views about people from a a, a race of uh, an, or an ethnicity of people in the in very world right right exactly like that that's where people have like i think that's where where they lose us exactly and that is exactly as you were saying before dave exactly what we have to be careful to guard against providing ammunition for mm -hmm. right uh in our in our yes. depiction um yep exactly now as i say we don't have to no, so within tolkien's world i think it makes to me perfect when you think about the 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 you know, the ontology of these different peoples, right? There's every reason to believe that elves and dwarves would just be wired differently, right? They're just not the same. They have different tendencies as a people, right? Because of how they were made, right? Um, and, and especially the dwarves being different from everybody else because of uh, them being Aule's own flawed and ill-advised creation, right? Um so, but we don't have to talk about that. We don't have to talk about it in those terms. What we see in Hakan, I really like your comment here. Um, when we encounter the dwarves in the, you know, uh, in the story of the first age, right? They are, as Hakan says, they are powerful, mysterious, secretive, perhaps innately magical. And sometimes that can be dangerous to others. Sometimes it makes them heroes. They are not to be trifled with. Yes, they are this, they are other to the elves, right? The extent to which, like, how much is that, you know, genetic? How much is that cultural? You know, we don't have to answer those questions. We don't even have to have that discussion. They're different, right? They're different from the elves. Their culture is very different from the elves. Their, uh, their customs are very different from the elves. Um, the personalities of many of the dwarves are different from many of the personality of the elves. Um, but, uh, you know, that whole... Elves are not prone to murder and dwarves are more prone to murder. That doesn't even have to be a major plot issue for us, especially given that we are in a post kin slaying world here, right? So we have plenty of, of elves who have uh, uh, kin slaying backgrounds, right? There's, there's plenty of murder going around here uh, in the <laughs> elvish community so that this is not an irrelevant issue. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, Ellen, that's a really great example. Um, uh, uh, 
Ellen thinking about how how Tolkien used the word black when referring to to orcs and ringwraiths. And Ellen, I think of this all the time when, um, you know, when like in, uh, uh, you know, when they when when they call the ringwraiths these black men, right? <laughs> That is not a phrase that a modern 20th century, you know, a, a 21st century person would use, right? When talking about guys who wear black cloaks, right? That's just not the way that that would be expressed because that phrase means something different, right? Um, so we need to be sensitive to that. Again, it doesn't mean we're actually changing anything from Tolkien. We just, again, don't want to uh, uh, to be opening up those kinds of uh, uh, those those kinds of things. Um, Okay. All right. Um, so back to the petty dwarves. Great. So the petty dwarves have been exiled and they're still being exiled. They have only recently started their new attempted to start their new community in Nargothrom. So now let's get to the, the eviction. How does this happen? So I, I'm in complete agreement. I think we're all in agreement that we don't want Finrod to come in and, and like, slaughter them. Like, okay. I, I, we agree with that. Um, the, the general vote here is that Finrod should even be ignorant of the fact that they lived there at all. Right. So he comes in and, and, and so, but let's back up a little bit because we need to set that story up a little bit more clearly. And I think the rest of it will follow. How does Finrod get involved here? Finrod tells Thingol of his dream and Thingol is like, cause remember we have the dwarves helping Thingol start Nargothrond, right? Or, uh, sorry, Menegroth, right? That was a plot point back in season three. So there's every reason for, to have Thingol be like, oh yeah, hey, you know what? Um, you want a secret place? Maybe an underground place like this? You know, hey, this is great. You know, I had some help. Let's ask good old Norn, right? Maybe good old Norn can hook us up, right? Um, so... Yeah, yeah. Um, th- then what happens? So Finrod would be like, okay, I'm amenable to this idea. Let's talk to the dwarves. So uh, Thingol's like, hey, Mablon, could you introduce Finrod to your friend Norn? And so they have a talk and Finrod's like, hey, I'm kind of looking for a place, you know, a little out of the way. You know, it could be highly defensible, uh, maybe uh, concealable from like almost everybody. Uh, you know, you know any place like that. And Norn... What does what does Norn do, right? Norn wouldn't do this independently. He'd have to, he'd have to. Look, but he was very heavily involved in the finding of Nargothrond, right? Um, mm-hmm. So Norn would volunteer, but we don't want Norn to be the villain of this piece either, right? Nope. Hmm. But at the same time, Norn would not necessarily think that it's a bad thing, right? Um to kick out the exiles because they're exiled, right? Um and he would not think much of their rights. Do we want to Yeah, so Nick, I'm not saying it isn't wrong that or isn't I'm not saying that it's necessary for Norn not to be in the wrong. My problem, Nick, full confession, I like Norn, and I don't want him to be the bad guy. I don't want him to be the the one who kicks out the indigenous people. Somebody's got to do it. But I, I don't want it to be Norn's initiative. Yeah, I agree he would view the exiles as squatters, but but see, here's the thing. The appeal that they would make, right? We need them to make their appeal. This is the only chance that we have, like pre meme, for the, um, for the petty dwarves to to voice their grievance. Right. We need to make sure that it is clear what you know Nargothrond means to the petty dwarves. So, during this encounter, when the dwarves come to the petty dwarves and say, "Get out." Right. They're going to say the petty dwarves are going to are going to make an impassioned address. Right. 
say we are exile we accept our exile this is this place is our future this is our ancestral home um I mean, that speech needs to be made. So what I what I what I am resistant to is I don't want Norn to be the one who is like, oh yeah, I hear that. I don't care. Get out, right? Like you know, that's gonna whoever says that is gonna be unsympathetic. Like <clears throat> there, I don't think there's any way around the fact that the re-exile of the petty dwarves it's not gonna look good, right? Our viewers are gonna be sympathetic to the petty dwarves. I think that's almost inescapable. And good, frankly. Um, that would set up meme interestingly later on, if we remember feeling bad for the petty dwarves when they were kicked out of Nargothrond. Um, so, okay. So, like I say, I don't want it to be Norn. I don't want Norn to be the one who's guilty of this. Now, I could be convinced. If you guys really want it, I'm not, I'm not saying I forbid it. I'm just confessing my inclination is to not have him do it. But I don't know who should. Who should be the... If it's not Norn, who is the bad guy? Uh, unnamed Norn associate. Unnamed Norn associate, yeah. Um... Chris Stevens is suggesting we could let the uh, the uh, the dwarves of Nogrod be the bad guys in this regard, as they are the less admirable of the mountain dwarves here. Um, yeah, Marie is thinking Lauren, king of Nogrod. Yeah. Uh, somebody remind me. I am. I don't remember anything about what we said about dwarvish politics and Norn's relationship to dwarvish politics. Um, that is when Norn brokered the allegiance, you know, the, the, the alliance between the dwarves and the Sindar. Were the dwarves of Nograd involved? Was it just the dwarves of Belagost who were marching to war or was it both? Was he, Serving as the ambassador to both clans, basically. Yeah, I remembered, Marie, that he was essentially from Belagost. Uh, yeah. Nick thinks I'm being a coward. I hear you, Nick. Uh, he, he, <laughs> he thinks it's cowardly to bring in the bad dwarves to do the dirty work here. I hear that. I hear that. Yeah. Uh, and yet. Yeah, and yet. I'm still unrepentedly of cowardly intentions here. Um, yeah. Do any of you guys remember whether. Uh, so, no. So, Marie, you say the King of Nagrod wasn't. Inter- they just. They were st- standing aside. So Hawkins is, he says, let's make Norn a bad guy and then let him die. Ouch. Oh, that is so cold, Hakon. That is so cold. Poor Norn. Marie is right that another way around this without bringing in the dwarves of Nogrod as scapegoats. Because I agree, especially if they weren't involved in the original conversations, then there's no point. Like, why would anyone even ask them? Why would they even be involved in this transaction? It doesn't make any sense. Um, referring dwarves to help, f- referring Finrod to some friendly dwarves who could help him find a home is not a thing you would do with unknown dwarves, right? You wouldn't then, like, send an ambassador to Nogrod and be like, hey, we've never really done anything with you guys and you guys basically stiffed us before, but can you help us now? Like, it doesn't make a lick of sense. So, it really can't be them doing this. It has to be the dwarves of Belagos because those are the only people the Sindar would ask for this kind of help. Um... Yeah.
I'm thinking. What I'm trying to think through here is what does what is the story? If it's Norn, what is the story? Uh, Marie's other suggestion, but I don't think I actually said what it was. Marie's other suggestion is we could always we could always just make it Norn's successor who does this. So and that would one effect of that, one positive, one one good effect of that would be to give the impression that like you know the 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 golden age of uh you know dwarvish ambassadors is gone right that norn has been replaced by a much less sympathetic person and so maybe we can anticipate that things are going to go south with the dwarvish elvish relations in the post norn era um that would be an accomplishment right um But, um, Nick is suggesting, and I think Karita was suggesting this before, too. Yes, yes. Um, Karita was suggesting this, too. What if Norn is a victim? What if Norn is staunchly anti-petty dwarf? Because he has a personal grievance, like one uh-huh. of his kin was killed uh, by go. an exiled dwarf, and so he thinks all exiled dwarves are scum because he, ha- you know, has a personal grievance against them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, that's more sympathetic. But I, Nick, ultimately, I agree with you. I don't think we should take the completely cowardly route, right? Because culturally speaking, the, you know, the dwarves of Belagost, um, the dwarves of Belagost don't have any problem with looking down on the petty dwarves, Right. They're exiles. They are scum. Um, It would be a cultural belief that the exiled dwarves are in fact lesser and less deserving of respect and of consideration than the dwarves who have not been exiled. That would be a pretty firm cultural belief by them. Um, And that doesn't have to look attractive. That can be a bad look. You know, Nick, what it makes me think of? It makes me think of Civil War stories, right? Civil War stories, like, if you're telling a Civil War story and there's, like, a Confederate figure that you really like, um, you still don't have to pretend he's not racist right you still don't have to pretend that he's some for some reason i mean it is cowardly it would be cowardly to be telling a story about you know say you're a big fan of robert e lee right and you're telling a civil war story it would be cowardly for a modern um you know a modern depiction to sort of try to recuperate robert e lee and say like oh he doesn't actually you know think that black people are lesser than white people you know i mean like yeah, like, you know, he might have been an admirable guy in many ways, but, like, he still owned slaves, right? Uh, and fought to defend, you know, so it's, uh, there's, that is cowardly, I think. Um, so having Norn have, having Norn reflect the beliefs of his culture, which is that the exiled dwarves are scum, essentially, right? Um, is... We should take the more cora- what what Nick is characterizing as the more courageous route to say that Norn is not a bad guy, right? Like we can still like him, but we should also acknowledge that he has these cultural beliefs that are uncomfortable, and the elves can be again. Mablung can be uncomfortable with it, and then it comes back around on Mablung again post Kinslang in in really interesting ways. Um, yeah, 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 exactly, Nick. I mean, you can admire Lee on you know as a soldier and admire him. Uh, you know, in, 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 you know, other ways, but still acknowledge that he was not completely right about everything, right? That you don't agree with him on every point. Um, 
Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, as Karita points out, from the standpoint of uh, one of the dwarves of Belagost, um, this would be a, a kind of a canny move, right? Uh, you kill, as Karita says, you kill two birds with one stone. You cement good relationships with the elves, and you punish your enemies, right? Uh, all in one shot. Um, that probably, right? I, I would think that the dwarves of Belgos would be, if they found out that the petty dwarves were like joining together to form an eighth clan and, and found a new ancestral home, on the one hand, like whatever they do, it's not like they're going to start a, 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 a pogrom against them necessarily, but I don't think they'd be all pleased about that, right? I don't think that they would feel like, oh, well, this is their right to set up a... We should respect their right to establish a kingdom of their own. I don't think they would respect their rights. Um, and I would think that the answer, you know, if 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 w- when the leader of the Petty Dwarves makes, makes the impassioned speech, right, and says, we're trying to establish our new kingdom, you've taken away everything else from us, can't you leave us this place which we are, you know, have begun to establish as our new ancestral home. Can't you at least leave us this? Norn or any other dwarf of Belgost would say, no, like you have no right to that. You know, you forfeited your right to an ancestral home when you did, when you, when your family did what you did, you know, like forget about it. Um, you got to think that's what they would say, right? Um, yeah. Um, Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm coming around to the, cause it really kind of has to be Norn, right? I mean, it has to be Ellen's right. When she said, she said a little while ago, the chronology is a little rushed, right? If we, if we kill off Norn of old age and have him replaced prior to the founding of Nargothron, we're getting rid of him super early in the season. Right. Um, and that seems a little soon. And I agree. So if it's not time for Norn's successor, it has to be Norn. Who else on earth could it possibly be? Um, the only other way we could get this off of being Norn would be if they went to Norn and said, hey, can you help us? And he's like, sure, I'll go back and get an expert from Belagost and we'll bring him in. in order to be. And then we're just introducing an extraneous dwarf character just because we you know, don't want Norn uh, to, to look like a racist and colonizer. So, yeah, I think, I think, I think we, we really need to. I think we really need to. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Karita having their ancestor, having being deprived of an ancestral home was part of their punishment, right? So yes, the, we're trying to establish an ancestral home of our own would not be a sympathetic argument to the rest of the dwarves, right? They would say you like, you are no, like you, you have no clan, you have no ancestral home. Um, yes. Yeah. They would not, uh, they would be totally unsympathetic to that. Um, and Ellen, exactly. We should, we have, therefore the dwarves. If we, especially since we're doing this early in the season, I really like this. We are establishing the dwarves with Norn involved, right? I'm reconciling myself to this. We, we establish them as a model for the lack of forgiveness and reconciliation, right? They are unwilling to work with them. They are unforgiving, um, of the other dwarves. And that, dynamic as we were already implying as i was already implying anyway with the whole setup for the kinslaying and the and the reveal of the kinslaying later on the dwarf plot then becomes a foil for the elf plot right and the two of them kind of mirror each other in some interesting ways um especially if we have characters like mablung <clears throat> um not approving of norn's attitude to the petty dwarves um, however, I know, I know that this brings in the question of, uh, uh, Finrod never finding out that others were kicked out of Nargothrond in order for him to be there. I'm not saying Mablung knows about the Nargothrond transaction in particular, but I think that the issue of the, the exile of the petty dwarves and, uh, not just the fact of their exile, but the attitude that Norn has towards them, the, that he considers them categorically as scum um, and, you know, having no rights and that they, you know, that they, he does not consider them part of his people at all anymore. That's the attitude that I think that Mablung should call him on, right? That Mablung should be uncomfortable with, 
which then again informs the discussion when it comes down to, but now, and now what do you think of the Noldor when you discover uh, the truth about the Kinslang? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good, exactly, Nick. We see the result of unforgiveness. We, see, we, we get a model of what it looks like. And this, the extent to which the petty dwarves as a people are sympathetic to, the, to our viewers is good. Then in that case, like, look at the suffering that's caused by unforgiveness, right? Um, the banishment of the petty dwarves, I think, can be shown to be both just and understandable. This is not like a racial subset of the dwarves that are being uh, marginalized just because they're different, right? The people who are banished have earned their punishment in general. Uh, the Dave remind me to come back in a second to that question about whether you're sent out with your whole family. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Cause that's a complicated question. But anyway, the banish, let's, let's for a second say the banishment is just right. But to say, we're not even going to allow you, we're going to stop you having an ancestral home, even building your own new life for yourself post exile. That's going a step too far. Right, banishing them in the first place it should not be a, should not be an unsympathetic step, I think. But the continuing attitude from Norn, like they're doing their time, you know, they're they're trying to build a home in in Nargothrond, should be sympathetic, right? This is them trying to rebuild a new life, trying to move forward uh, and to move past what they did, right? Uh, at least in some cases. Um. And the fact that their kinsmen from Belagost f- like prevent them doing that, prevent them moving past that and establishing a positive new life. That should look like here are the negative consequences of unforgiveness, right? Of, of refusing to reconcile um, and to move past that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and certainly, Ellen, and I agree. Whether we have the rest of their families being banished or not, I think we have... Uh, well, obviously, they're going to have children in exile, right? And their children are going to still be considered clanless, right? Um, so there will be... However we do it, whether we have whole families banished or whether we have uh, you know, them and all of their kin to come banished, innocent people are going to suffer as a consequence of this exile one way or the other, right? Um, and that still raises this important question. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Meme being the spokesperson for the person born in exile. Okay. Can I come back? Let's, let's come back to the meme question. Cause I said, we do that. I know we're running out of time, but, um, yeah, yeah. I want to come back to the meme question. So maybe address this question about uh, the sort of uh, um, uh, collateral damage in these exiles. Yeah. Well, Dave, what, what do you think about? Do you feel strongly that they should banish their whole families? Um, As I said, innocents are going to suffer. I, I don't feel. Or the other. I don't feel strongly about that specific policy. However, I think I think you know, like I'm I'm less interested in a story where. All of the exiled petty dwarves are are were criminals, and their status Personally is justified. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. I think it would be more interesting if there if there's an element of like of you know sort of uh, you know if it kind of reflects modern criminal justice in the sense that there's folks being punished who maybe don't deserve it. Right. Here's my th- yeah. I agree. Well, and certainly, all we need are kids for that to be true. Right. Oh, that's true. That's a good point. Like, so maybe a maybe single the single wide-eyed dwarf baby held in yeah. arms as the dwarves are leaving Nargothrond creates that. Right? Yeah, someone's marching out to their their exile. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that could work. My thought is so. Okay, thinking about this from a purely like from the from the point of view of dwarvish jurisprudence, as we were briefly considering it earlier on, if the exile. Uh, policy is intended to short circuit the cycle of vengeance within the dwarf community. Banning a whole family is not going to make things better, right? Cause that's just going to create a large faction. Cause 
they're going to be large and clannish, right? And they're going to be holding together right. in cousins and second cousins. So where do you draw the line? Like your parents and siblings or like just your siblings or your, your siblings and your children? In which case, like, what are your first cousins going to do? They're not going to be pleased, right? So trying to figure out, like, who is included in your family and who is not when your family is getting kicked out is going to be complicated and is going to lead to whole, like, divisions and potentially civil wars. I would think that could make things worse. So if we want to consider this as a reasonably wise and uh, understandable policy from the point of view of, of Azakal as the leader of uh, Belagost, I think... It, the way that seems to make most sense to me is that the individual dwarf criminal and anyone else in, anyone who's convicted of these crimes are the ones exiled, but that some other uh, family members choose to go with them sometimes. Oh, so, yeah, there you go. So, right. like, you might be... And there's kind of a, kind of a rigid policy, like, you know, that there, there's no... There's no thought given to um, readmitting, say, descendants or whatever. Exactly right. If it's known that if you go into exile with your spouse or sibling or whatever, then you are lumped in with them and you can't can't ever come back. Um, so that would also. So then, some of the people, some of the petty dwarves who are living in the in the new petty dwarf community, are there voluntarily. They have they're not personally guilty, but they have. They have chosen that, and yet again, the, it's it's therefore to for somebody like Norn to say the petty dwarves are scum is not justifiable, right? For that reason, it 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 calls that into question. Yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nick, Nick points out this would be especially true when the criminal is female, right? The husband just w wouldn't just let her leave because there's no way he's going to get another wife if that happens, right? With the, <laughs> given what we're told about dwarvish marriage. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I could see that. I could see that. Um, anyhow. Um, okay, so... So, yeah. So, okay, I, I, I like that. Back to the meme question. So here's the, the meme problem in a nutshell. I think, Dave, I'm pretty sure it was you and I who casually said, hey, let's have meme be the spokesperson for the petty dwarves from the, let's have him be like, you know, the father of all petty dwarves and the one who, and have him be ancient by the time we, you know, tour and tour comes around. And then, you know, of course, all the very sensible people on the discussion boards are like, okay, so you're in for making meme like 500 years old or more, uh, by the time we get around to the right. tour and bar story. Uh, now, first of all, I personally am not going to say that I think that that's impossible. After all, we're going to have to make Azakal pretty darn old by the time he gets killed by Glauron, right? Um, and we got around that by saying, well, he, Azakal is to the dwarves of Belagost as Durin is to, you know, the Longbeards, right? So he can be longer lived than, uh, uh, than the other dwarves, maybe. or You know, he's, he's different. Okay, fine. There are two reasons that I had for suggesting originally that meme be our spokesperson petty dwarf. One is a simple reason. One is a more complicated reason. The simple reason is if we don't have him, we need somebody else. We need a named petty dwarf. We need a spokesperson for the petty dwarves. Um, right. And we don't have any others. Like meme is literally the only one, the only petty dwarf we ever meet. Um, so, we have to invent another new character, and I'm a little, um, I'm a little, uh, uh, you know, troubled about um, uh, the need. I mean, we have enough characters in this darn story. I don't know that we need to, we want to go out of our way to invent new characters. So it is one of the things that I am thinking of. If ever we can conserve named characters uh, and, you know, if there's a, a role that we need played in the narrative and it can be played by somebody we've already introduced, that's generally preferable, I think, to having to, in, to make up a new named character. So, um, OK. The uh, second thing and the more complicated thing. Meme. Meme's a really minor character in the published Silmarillion. But, like, in the history of Tolkien's thought, meme's huge. I mean, 
part of me wants to pay a kind of tribute to the meme of old, right? Um, Meme was originally, like in the older versions of the Silmarillion story, Meme is like the the patriarch of the dwarf. He is like, Meme is to the dwarves what like Adam is to the humans. I mean, he is the original dwarf. He is, um, uh, you know, Meme is oldest and fatherless, right? I mean, he, that is, that is, like, he is super, super important. So when uh, you tick Meme off and he puts a curse on you, it sticks. The curse of meme is one of this. It's the curse of meme is like 10 times more powerful than the oath of Feanor in the original story. In the original story, the curse of meme trumps the, the Silmarils as like an important plot element, right? It is the curse of meme, which drives the entire plot. Um, for the like from that point on, like the entire story, the the whole like downfall of the rest of Beleriand is largely facilitated by the curse of meme. Um, so I kind of want to like do homage to that. Like a, a part of me wants to do homage to that. I can be talked out of it. I'm not insisting on it, but I am kind of thinking like, that was why I was sort of thinking, why don't we make meme this ancient patriarch? Uh, but I get it that it doesn't fit. And yes, of course, you guys are reminding me that we had decided that Azakal was going to be Azakal, the deathless reborn in his descendants. And it's, it's going to be like Azakal, the fourth, who is the one who ends up being killed by Glaurung. By the way, um, that by itself could be a really fun way to introduce the issue of dwarvish mortality, right? Um, wouldn't it be fun to have a conversation between somebody like Mablung and Azakal later on to, and Mablung is under the impression that he's talking to the same Azakal, right? And then that guy's like, oh no, that was my grandfather, right? Um, that would be kind of interesting. But anyway, whatever. Um, so I I don't know. I can let it go if we don't want I, and I agree with you, Nick, we don't have to have the impassioned speech person named. I mean, it's really the only role they're going to be playing. If we, if we're going to let the, if we're going to have the rest of the petty dwarves kind of vanish off the scene and not really play an important role again, uh, just like establish them at Amon Ruth so that we know they're there. And then when we come back to them seven years later in the story of Turin Turambar, we'll be like, oh, hey, yeah, the descendants of the Petty Dwarves. Here's this meme guy. Oh, he's descended from the Petty Dwarves. Oh, the Nargothron story. I remember that vaguely from seven years ago. Um, sure, that could work. Um, you know, and if, if they're not going to do anything else and they're not going to be important again, the dude who makes the impassioned speech doesn't have to be, um, doesn't have to be named, um, nor male, by the way. Of course, I hope you understand in my vocabulary, dude is gender neutral. Um, I use the word dude perfectly gender neutrally. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not implying that it's a guy. Um, uh, of course I use the word guy gender neutrally too often, but whatever. Um, so, yeah, it's fine, I guess. I'll just let meme go. Especially since we're not going to do the whole curse of meme thing, really, right? I mean, he can still right. curse, but obviously we're not going to give the curse of meme anything like the status that it had in, uh, you know, in the, in the earlier stories. So, yep. I guess I could, I should just let it go. Um, um, Ellen is suggesting we could establish a, um, you know, meme could also be reborn in his descendants, you know, so we could have a meme who's, and then like, you know, meme whom we meet with tour and his meme, the last, um, Ah, uh, no, I don't like that because I want that to be only the seven fathers of the dwarves for whom that happens. And he might consider himself, the, you know, this person might be 
become the sort of patriarch of the new unofficial eighth clan of the dwarves, but he's not one of the fathers made by Aule, right? So it probably wouldn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we can go ahead and name him, and yeah, name him something. Uh, Neem or something like that, right? Um, and uh, then Meme can be his descendant. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess that would work. That'd be fine. Because then at least we can still make a connection back to that grievance, right? And and yeah, that's fine. So I just call him Neem or something. Uh, and um, um, yeah, or 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 call him Meme, right? And and have him be renamed. Um, yeah, it, Ellen, I like that. That uh, uh, Meme's family is being presumptuous by doing the like he's not actually being reborn in his descendants, right? It's just they like to think that. Um, so uh, yeah, okay, all right. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Fine. I submit. So it's so. Hey, this way. I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I'm changing my frame here. We can. I can have my cake and eat it too, right? We can have this dude be called Meme, but he's not really Meme, so he doesn't have to be 500 years old later on. So that's okay. All right. Fine. Um, and I agree about Finrod not finding out about this and the. It wouldn't even be like it would be a big conspiracy, right? The dwarves of Belgos, of course, aren't going to tell them about that. A, because, first of all, they're dwarves. Why would they, like, give more information than they need to, right? Uh, they would consider that totally in-house business and none of, the, none of the elves' business, right? So they would naturally not mention it, and Finrod wouldn't know. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Um We need to stop because we're out of time. The question of the hunting of petty dwarves by the Noldor or anybody else. Um, I want to resume with that next time. So we've focused mostly on internal dwarf politics today, which is great. Next time, I want to come back to the question of the Noldor specifically. Uh, the Noldor in general, their attitude towards the dwarves. Karanthir specifically, and how his trade relationship with the dwarves begins. And we'll deal with the whole the question of... Um, uh, hunting of petty dwarves by anybody. Uh, and Aeol, of course, oh, if, boy. if we get to Aeol, we will, but, um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll work on that next time. The, the petty dwarf hunting is going to be a fun, fun thing. Yeah. Well, I, I actually don't think it's that hard, really. Um, I don't think we need to, uh, uh, I don't think it's that hard. All they need to be, all that needs to happen is somebody has to mistake them for either a subspecies of orc or uh, an ally of the orcs, and then mm. you have all kind, all the justification you need to say, "I want to, you know, rid my land of the servants of Melkor as we establish our kingdom." Like that's not a stretch, right? Um, True. So I don't think it's super hard. I'm not saying that that we, you know, we have to do this or make a big deal of it. I'm just saying if we did do it, I don't think it'd be difficult. But um, uh, hang on, Nick had one good idea. Let me see the good idea here. What if the dwarvish? Ah, ooh, yeah. So Nick says, uh, what if the dwarvish father's genes are so persistent that their descendants could be played by the same actors? So the same actor depicts every as I call that we get. Right? We keep having the same actor. Um, but meme is played by a new actor, which shows the presumptuous claim. So we have the old meme and the new meme and they don't look alike. Right. Um, and that would be a really good way of silently demonstrating. This is not meme reborn, even though he likes to think of himself as meme reborn. He's not really meme reborn because he, he's not the same actor. Whereas, um, all the Azakals would look identical because they would in fact be, be portrayed by the same actors. I like that. Right? That's a really good way to provide a visual cue without, um, without um, uh, having to talk about it. Cool. Cool. All right. I like it. Okay. Then I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to wrap up for now. So for next time, be thinking about broader, uh, especially Noldor Dwarvish relation, w relations, especially in the context of the, uh, this world that we've established here with this sort of 
uh, wandering petty dwarves who are beginning to gather in Nargothrond and then set to wandering again after they get kicked out of Nargothrond. Um, and in particular, those, uh, the, the, the sons of Fanor. I know there were several suggestions about that, so we'll, uh, we'll see. Um, okay, cool. Thanks everybody. Uh, I will, we'll see you guys in two weeks. Should be back, uh, two weeks from now. I'm glad it's not next week because then that was text moot, but it'll be the week after text moot. Um, so that is, what is it, two weeks from today, the 25th of uh, January. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you guys in two weeks. And I will say, as always, thanks for listening and Godspeed. Although the theoretical budget of our hypothetical blockbuster may be unlimited, the production budgets of this and the rest of our fun alternative educational projects are unfortunately not. If you have enjoyed joining our production team, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.